Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the second day of the Coastal Environment Hearings. Um, I just wanted to commence with a very brief uh, uh, formality in terms of health and safety that the entranceway through which you came in is the exit. If we have any emergency, you have earthquake or fire, and we're to assemble outside the, uh, outside the space sale house. Otherwise, like uh, the toilets are obviously up the same doorway, and uh, if I can just ask everybody to make sure you know, that this side is on, if you can, please. And otherwise, we're ready to commit to the group again when we can find the contact. Uh, Kia ora koutou. So, I'm appearing today as Council for the Rich General and Section of Coastal. Sorry, could you just. Oh, true. Sorry. Here we go. There we go. Right. So, appearing today on behalf of the Rich General um, on the Coastal Environment Chapter, and I hope <laughs> I hope you apologise. So, we're only just finished less than an hour ago, so they are very fresh. Um, but I have some legal submissions which I'm going to take you through. And um, first, actually, I want to acknowledge um, the submissions that Mr. Logan. Um, appeared before you yesterday on, um, and I do generally agree with and adopt Mr. Logan's submissions. The matters that I particularly want to speak with you about is the New Zealand Coastal Policy Statement 2010, um, and that of course is something which is of particular interest to the Minister of Conservation with her roles under the RMA, and the intersection between the Resource Management Act and the Fisheries Act, and then there's just a few little matters I'll touch on at the end. So, starting with the coastal policy statement, so when preparing the regional policy statement, the council must do so in accordance with the NZCPS and give effect to it, along with other national policy statements. And as Mr Logan noted, the coastal environment is the one aspect of the environment which must always have a national policy statement in place. 
that recognises the importance of achieving the sustainable purpose of the RMA in an integrated way across all regions for the coastal environment. It is also consistent with the requirement for regional policy statements to state processes to deal with issues between territorial authorities. And of course, here we have three territorial authorities whose boundaries include the coastal environment and also regions. The somewhat arbitrary nature of coastal regional boundaries calls out, in my submission, for integration of management between adjacent regions. I submit that this also comes back to the purpose of a regional policy statement, being to achieve integrated management of natural and physical resources across the whole region, including the coastal marine area out to the limit of the territorial sea. I agree with Mr. Logan, referring to Ken Salmon, that the objectives and policies of the NZCPS must be read together and as a whole. I also agree with his submission that it is important to consider the particular words used in each objective and policy. In the coastal environment, we are dealing with many unknowns. We are still developing our understanding of this space at the same time as new technologies and activities are being proposed, which may have potentially significant adverse effects. And that is why I do draw your attention to the Coastal Policy Statement Policy 3, which provides for a precautionary approach, in particular where coastal resources may be vulnerable to effects of climate change. And I think we've all seen some very recent examples of that. In the coastal environment, the avoidance policies, and I'm dealing here with one lot of avoidance policies, 11, Indigenous Biodiversity, 13, 1, Preservation of Natural Character, 15, natural features and natural landscapes, and 16, surf breaks of national importance, prescribe effects of activities where these effects will adversely affect outstanding values. The Supreme Court held in King Salmon that avoid in the context of those policies has its ordinary meaning of not allow or prevent the occurrence of. When considering how to apply the policies, they are to be assessed against the characteristics or values or attributes which the policies seek to protect. They do not prescribe activities in and of themselves, although the application of policies may result in some activities not being committed in some areas. And I've put that should be a reference to the Davidson case, which is an example of that. The focus of Dr. Schultz's evidence for the Director General is on the Indigenous biodiversity values in the coastal environment, which are to be protected, policy 11. I do want to stress that Dr. Schultz's evidence is intended to provide an overview of these values in the Otago region, supported by examples. Dr. Schultz has not attempted to provide a comprehensive assessment, in part because in the context of a regional policy statement, that may become too detailed, and in part, because there are knowledge gaps about the extent of some of these values in Otago's coastal environment. And I do, there's an example that I can think of, which is there are the coastal sea caves to the north of Karatani. Um, now those are likely, I don't know, those are likely to trigger policy 15 because it's a natural feature. They may also trigger policy 13 because there will be natural character experiential aspects relating to those sea caves. They possibly may also trigger policy 11 in terms of um, indigenous biological diversity, but we don't actually know because the caves are not particularly well known. Whilst I understand there is an extensive system, I don't believe there has been any particular surveys or studies done. It might be that there's particular species which like to take refuge in those caves. We just don't know. And so that's what I mean when I say that Dr. Schultz's evidence is simply trying to give you an overview and some examples, but is not trying to be comprehensive. Um, in relation to the other avoidance policies, the Director General has not called evidence on natural character or natural features and natural landscapes. These are not matters where the department has expertise. And for completeness, I note that Otago is blessed by having four surf breaks of national importance, which is more than any other region. Um, I just wanted to come back to avoid in terms of effects as opposed to avoid in terms of activities, because the coastal policy statement does have one policy which requires a particular activity to be avoided as a general rule. This is policy 10, 
dealing with the activity of reclamation. That shows the careful wording used in the coastal policy statement, where for that activity, the directive is to avoid unless, and then should the activity proceed, have particular regard to certain matters. Finally, on the coastal policy statement, I agree with Mr. Logan that in the same way that the NZCPS may be more rigorous for particular values in the coastal environment, while still being consistent with the sustainable management purpose of the RMA in general, similarly, the regional policy statement may impose more stringent provisions where this is appropriate and recognises and protects particular values of Otago's coastal environment. Policy 11 of the coastal policy statement doesn't refer to significant natural areas, and in my submission, this reflects the evolution of our understanding of how best to protect those Section 6C values in respect to significant Indigenous vegetation and significant habitats of Indigenous fauna. This protection under Section 6C is absolute. It is not qualified by references to inappropriate use or development, such as natural character and natural features and landscapes. I submit it is appropriate for the regional policy statement to apply an avoidance approach to protecting these values, which is consistent with policy 11 and would also be in accordance with part two, especially section mm -hmm. CC. As set out above, it is the adverse effects of the values which are to be avoided, on the values, sorry, which are to be avoided rather than their particular activities. Turning now to controls on fishing and fisheries resources, this is the decision of the Supreme Court in Motiti, where the court considered the overlap between a regional council's functions under Section 30 and management of fisheries resources under the Fisheries Act. Um, and so the court stated that the objective of the Fisheries Act is to provide for utilisation of fisheries resources whilst ensuring their sustainability. In essence, the Fisheries Act manages and regulates fisheries as a potential stock to ensure it continues to be used sustainably. And I've just, in a footnote there, set out the definition of fisheries resources from the Fisheries Act, which is what is adopted into the RMA and contrasted that with the definition of fisheries as used in the Conservation Act, which goes on to talk about fisheries being um, stock or part of a stock, et cetera, that can be treated as a unit for the purposes of conservation and management. Now that, in my view, is quite significant and it distinguishes again between the way the Fisheries Act manages those fisheries resources. Um, in the Fisheries Act, it balances maintenance of biological diversity against other matters, including setting the total allowable for a particular resource at a level to produce a maximum sustainable yield. By contrast, the RMA, Section 31B and 31GA functions are broader. The Supreme Court stated in the coastal marine area, Section 31GA is an important part of the legislative scheme that reflects the objectives and policies of the NZCPS. I don't want to particularly disagree with the call, but in my view, it's more that. Section 31 GA sets the bar, and then the NCPS helps to implement the bar. The court recognised that there are constraints in Section 32, which limit what reach of councils may do in the context of fishing and fisheries resources. The Motiti decision confirms its purpose or the intent of the actions that determines whether a proposed control is appropriate or not. The Resource Management Act control cannot be intended to manage fishing or fisheries resources for fisheries act purposes. And just coming finally to some additional matters, um, I wanted to update you on the continuing Southeast marine protection process. And I do understand that Mr. Allison for Kaitahu made some comments to you about this yesterday. So from the department's perspective, where we have got to is that advice has been drafted for the Minister of Conservation I understand that has also happened with MPI, with the Minister of Oceans and Fisheries. The department's own advice is close to final. There's a meeting today, I understand, to actually sign it off, and then it's expected to go to the minister. But given the reprioritization of government priorities announced and also following Cyclone Gabriel, we just don't know when this is going to progress. And that's as much as I can tell you. 
Um, I also just wanted to really briefly touch on the Māori commercial claims. Sorry, that should have aquaculture in there. <laughs> commercial Aquaculture Claims Settlement Act um, 2004, um, which may result in gazetted spaces in the coastal marine area to meet the Crown's obligation to provide iwi with aquaculture settlement areas. And of course, again, that uses the term spaces because in an aquaculture context, in a coastal environment in context, we are thinking in three dimensions. We are thinking about space within which the activity may occur. And I do agree that it would be appropriate to make provision in the regional policy statement to recognise those spaces once they are gazetted. And coming to the end, so I'm calling four witnesses today. So Dr. Schultz, who's going to come up and sit beside me in a minute, who is, um, his primary evidence is on the coastal environment. Mr. McKinley, whose evidence is on terrestrial ecology, Dr. Richardson, freshwater ecology, and Mr. Brown's. Um, so Dr. Schultz does have a summary of his evidence, which he will present for you. And Mr. Brown also has some notes. Um, Dr. Richardson and Mr. McKinley are just here to answer any questions um, as the evidence intersects with the coastal environment chapter. Do you have any questions for me? Thank you. Uh, thank you. So I don't really have any questions to be honest, but just I was just interested in the um, uh, commercial fishery sort of aspect uh, that my city case you talked about. Are you, are you aware of any other regional councils outside agriculture that get involved in managing fisheries for biodiversity purposes? So Absolutely. Had a, had a bit of a discussion about <coughs> this day in terms of the expertise that may be required to do that. So certainly there's the, the Northland Environment Court case, which um, I think that might have gone to the High Court as well, which um, deals with the intersect between fisheries, resources and fishing. And in that case, um, there were controls which were imposed to manage um, in a resource management context, there were controls that the court approved being imposed to, um, which were going to effectively manage fisheries and resources and fishing, but with the purpose being to maintain indigenous biological diversity. Um, and I can give you the reference to that case if you would like it. Yeah, well, that would be interesting because um, I think Dr. Schultz's evidence was quite clear about some of the impacts on those areas through various fishing types. So, um, can you can you actually get a copy of that decision to the hearing? I can certainly, yes, sorry, I'm just, I may have left that back in the office, but yes, I'll get a copy of that to you because that's a good decision. It, um, in my view, I mean, Matiti is a good decision too. What the Northern decision does is it says, okay, here's Matiti, we've got a whole heap of people with interest in particular places around the Northern Coastal Marine area. And um, then assesses evidence in respect to those areas, including cultural evidence, and determines what controls are appropriate. So it's a good decision. It's really helpful in my view. Yeah, the other thing <laughs> was interested in the Karatani Caves example. Yeah. Where are they located? They're on the peninsula or across the river. I understand that they are to the north of Cornish Head. Um, I have not been there. I have read a, I think it was a New Zealand Geographic article from some years ago now, which um, where someone in a sea kayak had gone and explored and, and taken some photos. And it looks amazing. They, I understand, really extensive. They go up to a kilometre inland from the coast. Oh. Um, but, yeah, that's all I can tell you. That's, and that's simply from having read that article. I can't tell you more than that. Imagine there'd be... Probably quite a few examples of that around in Natalia that we don't quite know about, especially on some of that Catlins Coast. Yeah, I, and I agree. Um, along the Catlins Coast, again, um, given the geology of that area, there's likely mm -hmm. to be other examples which we just don't know about. Yeah, yeah so what I took from Dr. Stokes' evidence is the lack of information, and um, I guess the, the it's probably stuff that's going to inform a, a regional postal plan rather than this, but it seems a big task. 
Yes, but um, again, in Dr. Schultz's speech in this, um, there is work that is being done. There's, as I said in my opening submissions, there's already some work which has been done as part of the Southeast Marine Protection Process. Um, so that's information which is held by the department and by um, Ministry of the Crime Industries. Uh, there's work which is done by LINS in terms of just surveying the coastal environment. Um, there's work which is done by NIWA. So there's, as well as the work that the council itself is engaged on, there's lots of things happening. There's the university. We have a very strong marine studies um, department here. I have no doubt that there's kind of lots of information out there. It just hasn't been pulled together. Yeah. So I think it's a bit difficult to size actually what the task is because I don't think we've even <laughs> gone so far as kind of going, so what do we actually know now? There's, there's stop working with Kotahu because we, we've heard a lot from guys like Brendan Black and Co who are yes. working in that space yes. and they seem to have a wealth of knowledge that needs to be brought into this. And, and of course, I think Mr. Fick is still um, on the managing committee of the East Otago Co op. Oh, yeah. So, um, yeah. Yes. So, so, yeah. So, um, so, yeah. So, that's a really good example. Now, that's probably information which actually is going to be held perhaps more by MPI um, rather than Doc. Doc certainly works with um, the Runaka, Runanga. And so, I don't think there's any issues at a local level, at least with sharing knowledge. Okay, thanks for that. You're welcome. I actually don't have a question, but I, I just make an observation, I guess, on on the issue around the culture that we exchanged with Edward yesterday, and and the um, Southeast Marine Protection Trust. But you, uh, you say that it's kind of on the back burner we bit at the moment for the department. I don't know that it's on the back burner for the department it's whether it's on the back burner of the government oh, okay. so so from the department's perspective no i think we are at a point where we are ready to go it's just to what extent government wants to move us along okay that's the mission well we look forward to that what happen okay thanks Penny. it's all good <laughs> yeah no thank you um the only i was just going to ask a point um Clarification. I've probably seen this uh, before. Is that Northland case that you referred to? Is that the re uh, for the regional policy statement or the coastal plan? It's in a coastal planning context. Yeah, right. So yes. Yeah. So again, um, I'm not I'm <clears throat> I'm not advocating, and I don't think Doc is advocating necessarily for additional changes to the regional <clears throat> policy statement. But certainly at a coastal planning level, that's where the controls would come in because, of course, it's in a coastal yeah. planning context so and have rules and a regional policy statement. Yeah, so you're reasonably comfortable that with broader policies at the RPS level, that leaves the door open for those types and, of and that's, if, that's, if, if, if deemed appropriate. If they're appropriate. And that's that's the, the thing, is actually just making sure that there is the room for them to come in in a regional coastal plan. Okay. Right, thank you. I've got uh, two concerns that I'd be interested in your response on. And the, the first really is the uh, obligation that is in this chapter to um, try and identify the uh, coastal environment. And I just wondered what your view was in the Otago regional or region uh, of how the provisions of um, policy one and particularly uh, F and H are to be applied off the ground. So if this is mm -hmm. the reporting requires the device and uh, some laws to recognize the coping environment and includes and then if elements and features contribute to the natural character landscape visual qualities or amenity values, and H, interrelated coastal marine, and I emphasize interrelated coastal marine and ter uh, terrestrial systems, including in the tidal zone. Now, how far back in terms of land do you say that that uh, ranges? That is a really good question. Um, 
And that's actually a matter which is again going to have to be set in the context of a coastal plan because that's where you define the coastal environment. Um, so, so we understand. But, but can you? Because the coastal plan ceases it in high water springs. Not true. So you've got so a situation have, yes. where, the, where the territorial authorities and the district plans are going to have to try and identify a coastal environment. This is actually where you turn to section 64, of, which is the plans provision of the RMA, which indeed, again, I accept that a coastal plan in terms of the matters that the minister is responsible for ends at mean high water springs. That doesn't mean you can't have a regional coastal plan which actually goes beyond the coastal marine area and includes some of these more coastal environment matters. And that would not be something which the minister would be required to approve, but certainly would be something that the council could do um, to, as you say, um, actually deal with these interrelated um, areas. And so the classic example, of course, is estuaries, where how far upstream from the estuary do you go um, when you've got that intermingling of freshwater and coastal water and a whole heap of values which are going to be, and then a whole heap of, I guess, in terms of natural features, a whole heap of experiential aspects as well. So in my view, a regional coastal plan may primarily deal with the coastal marine area, but I consider it can also extend beyond that to deal with the coastal environment as a whole. You say that's in section 64? I think it's section 64. Can you take me to the word? Uh, not right at the moment because I don't have the act with me. Oh, right. Um, I had referenced that somewhere actually. The section 64 of my memory, and I'm just sort of pulling it up now, says there shall be, that there shall at all times be all the coastal marine area of a region. One or more regional coastal plans prepared and uh, set up schedule one. Sorry, my... oh, look, I'm being unhelpful with you. Um... Yes, I'm, I, I, I am. I know there is a provision, and I, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't tell you exactly which one it is at the moment, but which essentially allows for a regional plan to deal with indeed the coastal marine area, but also to expand beyond it. And it's that the so that's so there are many plans around the country, which or regions around the country, which have, I think it's Marlborough has an integrated regional policy yeah, development. Yeah, and, and, the unitary, and, unitary councils exactly. have no problem. No, so, but, uh, but we haven't got a unitary No, but, uh, but I'm talking even in a, in a, at a regional context, there are places that have tried to have a regional policy statement and regional plans in the same document. And it might be that that's something that the, whatever is coming out of the NBE is driving us towards. Um, but- I could just jump in here and assist. Yes, section right. 64, subsection 2, a regional coastal plan may form part of a regional plan where it's considered appropriate in order to provide integrated management of the coastal reef area to any related part of the coastal environment. Right. I Thank see. you, Mr. Logan. Appreciate that. Right. Thank you. And that does indeed, you see, coming back to your concern, like policy one, that does cover those matters in um, policy one, paragraph H, the interrelated coastal, marine, and terrestrial systems, and also at F, elements that contribute to natural character, landscape, visual qualities, etc. I I'm really posing this question, I suppose, Mr. Logan. Your top panel, Ms. Williams, really, uh, the, um, that subsection two, in terms of Otago, means that that could be addressed, as you were saying, in the, uh, in the land of fresh water plan that's being worked on at the present time. Well, well, certainly, section 64 allows for that possibility. Uh, I'm not aware of any decision having been made to take that approach. Um, right. But it, it is certainly a, an option open to the regional council, yes. I would well, back to you, Ms. Williams. I mean, it, 
what what do you say that either the regional council, if it was to be that approach, or the district council, if it was to be territorial um, the territorial authorities if it be district plans, what do you should say should be their approach in terms of the application for those provisions of G and H? How far back into the uh, into the land of life should they go? And trying to identify the coastal environment uh, Certainly. area uh, when uh, you've got a base principle of uh, Kiyuta Kitai. Exactly. So, so Kiyuta Kitai is, is used in a freshwater context, but it also has application in a, a land context. Um, in my view, coming back to the coastal policy statement in terms of the coastal environment, I do consider that it is appropriate and relevant to have a coastal plan which deals with the coastal environment as a whole and yes that may mean that it has some aspects which incorporate some huge kitai there would need to be careful integration with other plans and it might be that could be with the land and water plan when that comes to fruition to make sure that they are all integrated but i think that's very sensible because otherwise you are dealing with somewhat arbitrary boundaries um, and also with mean high water. Well, that's actually something which is changing again, potentially as a result of climate change. So there's a need to actually not just manage to the arbitrary boundary, but to manage across. The other major thing that I was interested in your reaction to was um, just the obligation that at the moment the uh, plan is imposing to try and uh, identify strong um, provision again those areas of uh, significance in terms of indigenous biodiversity and uh, the concern that I think arises out of um, Dr. Schultz's evidence is that um, whilst there is a, a body of material and that's available in terms of benthic surveys or whatever it might be as it led to that information. Um, is it at a sufficiently robust stage for uh, regional the regional council to be able to identify areas where it can actually, in terms of the coastal plan, impose restrictions on uh, full line uh, areas, for example, uh, to protect areas of um, significant uh, areas of significance in terms of the benthic uh, communities that are there? I don't think I can answer that because I think my response is going to be that we simply don't have the information. Um, and that's where the methods are important because the methods drive the, the need to go and do this work um, to identify potentially such areas including, of course, working collaboratively with Kaitahu and others. So, so yeah. how fair is it in the overall context to impose an obligation on a regional council to carry out that marine benthic work? Uh, and how far off shore is it really required? That I guess it's massive. <laughs> absolutely. If we're going right up to the 12-mile limit, it is massive. Um, and I suppose that we are always going to have <clears throat> situations where particular areas where activities are concentrated, we're going to know a lot more about. And then when people propose to do an activity in an area which hasn't been visited a great deal before, then there's that concentration of effort. I don't expect, and I don't think it is fair to expect any regional council to do, as you say, a, a full survey for a regional coastal plan out to the 12 mile territorial sea for its entire coastline. That's unrealistic. Um, <coughs> what I say, however, is that we have knowledge, <coughs> excuse me, we have knowledge currently about areas where activities are already concentrated. And that's clearly going to be the focus to start with. And then it's just going to be a developing game. It's the only way it can be. 
especially. You're welcome. Here I will give my um, summary of my evidence. And if there are comments, just let us see. The coastal, uh, the Otago coast environment harbors a wealth of indigenous biodiversity values. Known examples include biogenic habitats, which are those formed by living organisms such as tube warm fields of Omeru and the dry zone thickets of the Otago Peninsula, as well as a range of threatened indigenous fauna, um, such as penguins, sea lions, and albatrosses, just to name a few examples. However, gaps remain in our knowledge with respect to verifying the location and extent of these values. The proposed Otago Regional Policy Statement will need to give effect to the New Zealand Coastal Policy Statement, Policy 11, Indigenous Biological biological diversity. Therefore, my evidence is largely structured around this policy. Objective one of the NZCPS requires safeguarding the integrity, form, function, and resilience of coastal environment and sustaining its ecosystems, including marine and terrestrial areas, estuaries, dunes, and land. Furthermore, policy 11 directs the avoidance of adverse effects of activities on the most valuable and vulnerable components of New Zealand's indigenous biodiversity and the avoidance of significant effects on other values. The tables in my evidence and chief give examples where policy 11 values likely exist and are not intended to cover all indigenous biodiversity ecosystems and habitats in the Otago coastal environment. This is in part because we don't not we don't have comprehensive knowledge on the Otago coast environment. In my opinion, the proposed Otago regional policy statement will need to give effect to policy 11 by including provisions that require um, the identification of areas where indigenous biodiversity values relevant to policy 11 exist, and um, b avoiding adverse effects of activities on these values in accordance with policy 11a applies high protection to threatened significant values and avoidance of significant adverse effects on other values in accordance with policy 11b. And C it requires specifying the criteria that will be used to assess the significance of ecological areas or habitats. Note first we need to identify what is there. And this will then have to set the appropriate level of protection in district and regional plans. With respect to my first point, the requirement of identifying indigenous biodiversity values relevant to New Zealand Coastal Policy Statement Policy 11, there's some existing knowledge, but significant gaps remain in terms of uh, the location and extent of indigenous biodiversity values in the coastal environment of all time. Examples of knowledge gaps include the characterization of biogenic habitats and offshore rocky reefs. With respect to my second point, the requirement to avoid adverse effects of activities on biodiversity values, I specifically address the adverse effects of fishing and aquaculture in my evidence. Um, bottom contact fishing methods such as trawling and dredging can have adverse effects on biodiversity values. Similarly, aquaculture can have localized effects on marine habitats. Therefore, the proposed target region policy statement needs to ensure it has provisions to manage adverse effects of all activities to maintain indigenous biodiversity values. I support an integrated approach to criteria for identifying areas of significant indigenous biodiversity in Otago. In my opinion, this is necessary to account for the coastal and marine environment crossing boundaries with terrestrial and freshwater systems. 
A good example is um, Hoiho, the yellow-eyed penguin, who forage out at sea but must come to land to breed. I support the use of significance criteria listed in the exposure draft um, New Zealand um, policy statement for indigenous biodiversity as they are applicable across marine, freshwater, and terrestrial environments. Thank you, Dr. Schultz. Thank you, Dr. Schultz. Um, I found your evidence very interesting and helpful in the context of all of this. Um, although you'll have to excuse me because some of your um, some of the terminology I didn't quite understand. What are bryozoan thickets? So they are um, they are benthic invertebrate organisms that form colonies. So they're actually living beings, um, animals rather than actual plants. Yes. So okay. they, they they look a bit like corals. Yeah. So that's they build sort of reef-like structures, and they are sort of their habitat formers. So um, they're quite important uh, because they provide habitat for other species, such as you know fish or or uh, there might be um, assemblages with sponges, for example. So yeah, it provides habitat to a range of other species. So the biodiversity is relatively high in these areas. Yeah, okay. So on, on land, they look <coughs> like a, a rainforest or something. It's, it's a good comparison, I'd say. Yeah. 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 Um, your evidence highlighted actually the, the lack of information um, you talk about in terms of policy 11, we need to identify these areas and um, the P's a mammoth task. But mm. I noticed, um, I think in your paragraph 22, you talk about observations for fishermen. Um, yep. And also, I think at the bottom of paragraph 10, you use the phrase predicted distribution of um, the particular organism. Mm. So, how do, you, do you guys actually collect information from commercial fishermen and how does that all that work? Um, so, so there's different sources of data. So I think um, Ms. Williams mentioned already like the opportunistic, well, it's data collection by, by lens uh, for a different purpose. So they use it along the shipping lanes, they, they run multi-beam surveys to basically for the purpose to ensure there's no big rocks in the way of, of uh, the ships. Yeah. But this data, you know, we can access and we can get information about the sort of bottom um, habitat characteristics. So, so you basically have a base there that you can work from. Yes. In terms to try and ground truth these holes in the information that will feed into a yeah, that's correct. potential coast. And, and, and in, a, in addition, um, of course, there's information collected by universities as well. Yeah. Um, I, um, we as a stock, um, you know, me working in the yellow penguin space, for example, we've, uh, we've commissioned some work last year that UNIO targeted for us to uh, do a multi-beam survey um, northeast of Aramoana, because we know from tracking data of penguins, that's an important foraging habitat for yeah. them. So there's all that patchy information out there. And, yeah. and, um, and maybe just to put your mind at ease a little bit. So um, I've been involved in, in uh, a, a workshop with, uh, led by the Tag Regional Council, actually, and you know, um, stakeholders like NIWA, uh, university researchers, and that you know, a task is being done to collate all the data that is out there at the moment. So that work is already underway, uh, and I understand it's, it's being progressed. I guess the reason I ask and interest around that is um, <laughs> I don't know much about the marine environment, but just being involved in um, terrestrial um, biodiversity matters. Yeah. The, if it's not ground truth and, and proven, you have a difficulty in, in policy and enforcement. And if that ends up in court, you're in sort of trouble. But what you're saying here is that that works underway, I guess. It's the collating of, of existing data. Um, which that can then be mapped. And I think this will, once this task is done, it will help to identify gaps. And that's where targeted surveys yeah. uh, can come in and, and fill those gaps. Your tables identify pressures on the various um, ecosystems you identify. It doesn't quite tell me how 
severe that pressure is, is that a phase of that work as well? In determine, because I, I do know some of that, um, Mr. Flat, when he presented on behalf of Kaita, who addressed some of the work he was doing in that space, which I found quite fascinating. So I, I guess that's the next phase once you identify these areas, you work out what's impacting on them. Yeah, and I think what also will have that for some areas you may have time series of data so we can actually yeah. observe change or, or don't observe change. So yeah, that's I think he, he's done some work in sedimentation on how it's affecting them, which I was really interesting. So I guess you guys tap into that sort of information as well. Definitely um you're looking at that yeah. I was a little concerned that you were going to protect uh, habitat for red caterpillar spiders. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, admittedly, um, that's not my, you know, I'm not a, a spider scientist, but I, yeah. I just wanted to. Yeah, I'm niggly with something. You know, <laughs> um, you know I guess your tables, you, and you deal with it over, you've had a bit of discussion around agriculture and how it could be provided for. Um, Yeah, I think um, the awareness probably informs the brass about what should be in that, that policy in the RPS on aquaculture, which is a bit thin at the moment. Um, but I think the regional council staff rely on the fact that everything has to be read together in that sense. Um, What's your sort of view on that, given a sort of a specific sort of activity that uh, needs to be addressed in this, this domain? I think for my um, for my understanding of the needs of cost of policy statement, there's a policy in there that requires um, the, yeah, providing for aquaculture. And I think that's why, and, and um, Mr. Brass might correct me on that later, um, why that needs to be included in in the Pagadishan policy statement as well. Um, I would like to mention that um, apart from adverse effects, there's also some known likely positive effects of aquaculture. Now, can, um, the structures can provide sort of artificial reefs for organisms um, or roosting sites for birds, but whether those positives outweigh um, the potential adverse effects, um, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a question that yeah, so I found your, your figure five really useful in terms of how that all yeah. works. And I guess when you link that up to your your tables where you identify these various um, ecosystems, that probably the ecosystems you want to avoid is something like that. That's right. Yeah. And especially aquaculture, as, as this figure on figure five on page 30 illustrates, um, it mostly affects things that are beneath the structures or in, yeah. in, in vicinity because you know things like anchor damage as well for example um, it depends a lot on the type of marine environment as well if there's, if there's strong currents then maybe the nutrient uh, input from like fish food and things like that won't be such an issue but if it's like it's more like a standing water body then that's probably something that needs to be looked at okay well, thank you very much for it one of the challenges for Māori and for Kaitahu in particular in this region is the issue around marine protected areas and the use of things like mātaitai and taiāpure as against protection of indigenous, I shouldn't say against, but in line with the issue of protection of um, indigenous biodiversity. They don't always go hand in hand. There was a tension there at times. And I just wonder what your thoughts were on that. I mean, do you have any you know, thoughts on, um, because it's going to lead on to another question I have about um, actual species that, that uh, Doc, you've identified as, as being, I guess, a priority in terms of protection. And that will, butt up against um, the sort of mahinga kai mm. 
focus that Kaitahu has. You know, there's a, you know, a lot of our stuff is around Mahinga Kai, yeah. which is kind of a little different from Indigenous biodiversity. It's the same, but it's different. What are, you, what are your thoughts? So, my understanding is that like, um, um, oh, uh, uh, Matai Tai and Kai, 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 they they control fishing to some extent, but they're not about necessarily protecting like threatened species. So I understand there's a there's a conflict there. Um, I unfortunately I don't I don't have a solution yeah. for you on that. So <laughs> I wish I had. Wish you like that would love a solution. <laughs> um, so the crunching points will be like you like you said will be species in those areas that are classified, for example, the um, New Zealand threat classification system as threatened or at risk. Yeah. So those will be the species that, um, from a management perspective, I'd be concerned about. And you know, those are the triggers in the policy 11A and, uh, and B. Um, yeah, but I don't. I mean, there's, there's a, a sustainability angle. Mm -hmm. It's not just that they want to have access to yeah. kai and all that sort of stuff, but it is the sustainable management. Yeah, you want to be able to it. Yeah, I mean, which energy. is long term, you know, you've got to protect yeah. the biodiversity. In this case, it's kai, it's fish and shellfish and, and that sort of stuff. So, in that respect, mm -hmm. at least is the way I, I view it, they do go hand in hand, but I guess it gets back to <clears throat> the sort of Kyuta Kitai thing that Kaitahu has emphasized repeatedly in this hearing, which is a more holistic view on the management of our resources across the board. You know, it is it is about linking all the bits together, whereas I think even with <clears throat> With the sort of policy statement, what I call a policy statement approach, it silos bits. Put that bit there, yeah. another bit there, and another bit there, and then you're then you're rushing around trying to link them together or trying to do something about sort of making a sort of a, a, a bigger picture. I agree. We we especially uh, you know scientists would like to draw lines around things and and define things so. Um, the challenge would probably be, and I'm, you know, I'm not a planner or or don't have a legal background, but I think the challenge would be to get the wording and the provisions right to sort of allow for that balance. Um, and I unfortunately don't have a solution to that right now. But I mean, one of the issues is one of the chair just raised with the previous or with Penny earlier on about defining coastal environment and you know all that. There's a whole bunch of those things that that are, I guess they test the system and they certainly test this process in lots of ways. And then we spend a lot of time just trying to define something. I mean, in, in, in a Kyoto Kitai approach, it's fairly obvious. Do we need to? If, do we need to define them as, as what I'm sort of getting at? I might interpose here and <laughs> simply to say that um, so this is perhaps an example where the New Zealand Coastal Policy Statement drives certain things and certain outcomes. And there is, um, Objective 3 deals with, um, to take account of the principle of the Pretty of Waitangi, recognising the principle of Kaitiaki, and so on. But it, it perhaps has not then been integrated through the balance of the NZC previous in a community Kitai way in particular. And it it acknowledges um, Maori interests, iwi interests in um as Mana Moana in the space, but it just hasn't quite got there. And I think that's as much as anything else, just about the age of this document, because it was 2010. It's still a very good, robust document, but um, this Kiyutiki Tai concept is really something which has developed, particularly in the freshwater context, 
I consider you're right, it has equal application in the um, marine context. Yeah. Just not sure that this is quite there. Yes. Thanks a lot. Oh, unless you have more comments, you want to make? Um, I'm okay for now, thank you. All right. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you very much. I also found your evidence um, very interesting, and it, and it was, um, I suppose, interesting to me to read about, uh, you know, the, the lack of knowledge and information of the coastal environment here and then kind of put that in the context of um, what we're, well, what the NZCPS is trying to achieve and then the, you know, the provisions in this plan and, to, you know, how can it all be implemented, I suppose, on the basis of that. And following from that, in, interested in the uh, Southeast Marine Protection Process and how much information was needed for that. I would have assumed that, that there was a reasonably robust level of information needed for that process. So I haven't, I haven't been involved in that process, mm -hmm. um, so I can't really, I can't really um, say how much information yeah. was put together for that. But um, I know that a, a colleague of mine, Greg Finnell. I, I know from just because he sits next to me and he works in this space that he, you know, he goes out uh, with the boat and does ground shooting of these proposed areas. So there's, I think, two proposals on the table. And he's still, um, even though it's sort of in the process at the moment, he's, he's, uh, he's still doing some ground shooting here and there to make a stronger case for specific areas. So it's, it's work in, in progress. Yeah. Um. Other question I had was in relation to your the tables and your evidence. Um, and I was interested to see that, you know, there's, there's quite a lot of overlap and I, um, you know, I get that because some ecosystem types or vegetation types are going to be picking boxes and <laughs> more than one of the, the, the subsections. But I suppose I was interested where some things that come under policy 11A and 11B um, and, and how, I suppose, how that, how that plays out. And I suppose we've got sort of, you know, Hoiho coming in in 11A, um, but then the habitat coming in in 11B. And to me, that was thinking if you, you know, if, you, if you're going to protect, uh, you know, as is required under 11A and avoid the adverse effects, then the habitat is something that needs to be protected alongside that. Is, is that something that you considered when putting those tables together? Or I'm just I'm just wondering if, and this is probably a question more for, for Penny or Murray, but you know, are the 11A and 11B sort of mutually exclusive? Or, and I mean, I'm assuming A trumps B, so B and A not B. I, I was just, and I was just wondering, Dr. Schultz, how you, you know, how you went about compiling those tables and deciding what goes where. So in terms of the, the latter question basically um i started off with the policy level of the ease and cost policy statement and um uh, sort of familiar myself familiarizing myself with the wording uh, which is quite technical in, in places i find and um then started to have a look for examples um that, that trigger these criteria so the first table um which is policy 11A, taxa that are threatened or at risk, that was in, in many ways the easiest one because it's clearly defined. Um, so we've got the New Zealand threat classification system, um, you know, where the various, um, you can download lists with all the threatened birds or um, yeah, other marine animals. So, um, and I was surprised that, that that's mostly, you know, the, the sort of larger, Big ticket items I, in there. I can probably yeah. explain that. So that's um, that's probably based on the field that I'm working in. So right. I have a marine ecology background, but I've for a few years now spe specialized um, on birds yeah. and um, did a bit of work. Um, or when I worked for the tourism industry, I worked um, in marine mammal space as well. So that's just where my um, my personal or my my expertise lies. I uh, just want to re-emphasize that that's not meant to cover everything. It's really just to, to make a point that 
values are there that sort of um, grant um, provision to um, manage adverse effects of these values. Okay. So the threat classification system could be having a number of smaller fish and seaweeds yes. and rhizomes and whatever else. There's various okay. um, various documents for the different species groups. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the and then uh, the other things, for example, like um, let's check which one is this here. In, indigenous ecosystems and vegetation types that are threatened. That's policy 11A3. Um, I found that a lot harder to find examples there because um, um, there's no such thing at the moment as a threat classification system for marine ecosystems. We've got this for the terrestrial environment, but not in the marine space. So um, I use scientific literature looking at different um, ecosystem types uh, talking about what the um, threats are to these ecosystems and um, what the trends are. So I just really formed an opinion here um, that these classify, in my opinion, as threatened. But um, admittedly, another marine scientist might disagree on some of those that I picked here. So mm -hmm. it's not clearly defined, um, but um, it is a challenge, but um, I think even though someone would disagree with me on some of the points, we probably have a large overlap as well. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and no, I think it's helpful. It's, it's, it's just kind of, you know, I suppose I'm asking that question just to try and get a feel for how, how, how easy or, or not it is to actually, yes. I suppose, put things in the in the relevant boxes in here um, for, for implementing the, the policy. Yeah. So um, just a comment on that, um, back to the Southeast Marine Protection Forum, I, I'm aware of a, a, a workshop approach that was taken to, uh, you know, come up with those areas and that, that involved not just scientists, but also, I believe, fishermen were consulted as well and, um, and community um, and Tahu. And um, so I would imagine that a process like that would probably be good to uh, account for the various um, views and 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 um, yeah aspects and, and and knowledge sources as well. No, thank you. One of the interesting things that arises out of the GCPS is that uh, policies. 13 and 15 have wording requiring mapping or identification by mapping. And um, policy 11 doesn't. Um, whereas the proposed regional policy statement does require in. Uh, Method two, top clause three, identification of areas and values of indigenous biodiversity within the jurisdiction of local authorities, uh, map the areas and describe their values. And that's what's been troubling me uh, against the background of your evidence, where you're saying that uh, there are large gaps in, in, in knowledge and just how reasonable and feasible really is it to impose that sort of obligation um, on a regional uh, council to try and map identify areas and values of indigenous biodiversity when you look at your uh, your figure one at page uh, 21 yeah. evidence is it I know that's a very broad brush map, but it just shows the extent and the offshore extent for that matter uh, that could be involved. And what a colossal task it would be to do that mapping. Listening to your evidence um, and just listening to your council's uh, response to earlier questions, too, is it not reasonable to suggest that that subclause three? might have some wording along the lines uh, 
identify areas and values of indigenous biodiversity and map as appropriate to the state of knowledge. So I'm um, not a, a planner, but so I'm, I'm careful there with coming up with wording, but but I agree with you, you know, that it is a lot of space to cover. Um, there is there is more information out there than is here on, on, on figure one. So that's that's um, mainly concerning biogenic capitals. Right. But um, you know, there's there's more spatial data available for say megafauna or um, or other you know benthic surveys that, that have been done. So some that information will come out in this uh, task that is underway at the moment. Um, it, it is a very broad data set um, that is being put together. So, um, so there would, a lot of those gaps, I'm confident, will be closed um, doing that. Um, at the same time, I think we'll always have to acknowledge that the information will be patchy. And um, therefore, I think we, we need to acknowledge that and and also work with that. So I think the expectation to map everything is, is probably is probably quite high. But um do broad. Do, do broad and do as good as we can, I'd say, with the resources available. Right. And the other concern that I've discovered is that if you just look, and I know these are very broad brush maps and very interesting, <laughs> but if you're figure four, if you um, it's really even the face of overlapping uh, in four lines and all activities over that last 10 year period, uh, or that back 10 year period, seem to overlap quite a lot of those areas. Yeah, it's um, it's quite, um, yeah, impressive. impressive is probably the wrong word. It's, it's um, striking. Impressive. <laughs> depressing. Depressing. <laughs> yeah, yes. Um, so, um, mm. yeah, I got that. Map uh, provided by by MPI, um, but personally, I was surprised that they just gave it to me like that. <laughs> but um, it is, it just shows that there's a lot of bottom trawling effort in this area. And, yeah. um, On figure one, I was just intrigued at the uh, uh, the last item on the uh, legend the fishing grounds. What, what does that relate to in that report? So that's. Uh, Sort of top top right of the uh, figure on the actual on the actual figure. Yes, you see the number nine. I'm, I'm taking. Oh, that's that one here. Oh yes. Yeah. You know what that relates to? Just out of interest. Mm. Um, no, I can't answer that right now. Unfortunately, sorry. No, I would have sorry. to I'll go back into the report. Uh, that's right. So um, possibly unusual rocks. I mean, we have we've got unusual rocks separately, and um, we've got power, which refer to rocky reef. Um, maybe it's a yeah. I'm just. I mean, I would have to to guess now. Maybe it's sort of an, an other guess. category. No, no, no. <laughs> but uh, but I can I can look that up um, if you like me to. No, 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 Actually, no, no. the other option it could be, sorry, just looking at the, um, the key is fishing grounds. Yes, that's what I said. Mm -hmm. At paragraph 52, getting back to this issue of um, mapping or surveying, you talk about um, accurate mapping requiring targeted surveys. And uh, So you, my experience from the Marlborough situation and 30 or 20 or 30 odd years of being involved with the development and expansion of the aquaculture industry up there was, has been that uh, most of the detailed benthic surveys are activity induced, i.e. somebody has a marine palm proposal or a mm -hmm. uh, um, salmon palm proposal or whatever it might be, and they'll, they'll then conduct a uh, very detailed benthic survey on what communities are likely to be affected, and then they'll do a projection of what might be the uh, uh, depositional stream that might come from whatever the activity is. 
uh, and what that effect might be on those um, uh, communities, or if it's an existing farm trying to seek a renewal, uh, what has been that effect over time. Um, in reality, to get to a state of certainty where you could uh, impose in regional plans rules restricting or, uh, or preventing uh, bottom trawling through those sorts of communities, you would need that sort of certainty, wouldn't you? Yes, I think that's where the what what um, Miss Miss Williams um, commented on earlier is, um, and and relates to to the previous question as well. I think that I suggest to have a, a broad a broad you know overview of where things are by collecting data, and then filling in gaps of you know areas that we we think are important or where we think. Say a biogenic habitat might extend to. We might just have a, um, you know, we may know it's that it's definitely one location, but we don't know the extent of it. So I'd say we probably focus on uh, surveying the extent of this, and we end up with a patchy, in my view, with a patchy map of of important values. But there will always be those gaps, and if if there's a proposal coming in to do an activity there. The level of detail required, I agree with you, will probably have to include like ground truthing um, of that specific site, definitely. Um, because uh, even if you do a multi beam survey of a certain area, so that's sort of a sonar technology that gives you a first big signal and you can say, ah, this is probably biogenic habitat. Um, so that's sort of information level. Um, but you need more detail than that, in my view to evaluate or assess a potential adverse effect of that proposed activity. I, I agree. No answer to <laughs> that's, that's, that's good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so thank you, Dr. Shank. So that's you. Um, so I was now going to call, I think, yes. I think it was um, Mr. McKinley. Uh, good morning. Um, um, Bruce McKinley, I'm a traditional ecologist. I'm here to ask questions and support my colleague, Dr. Schultz. No, I didn't have any questions for you. Thank you very much. Next time, maybe. And <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah, no, none for me either, but it will be next one. <laughs> <laughs> I just need to check. Yes, all I would say, Mr. McKinley, is that in your paragraph 132, uh, the highlights the issue that we try to deal with here around that silo and different plans from different areas and that connection. Um, yes, and listening to the conversation before, it, it does drives home to me the, the problem that we have with um, silos, lines on a map, and, and sort of um, the way we've done things in the past and um, whether it's in a traditional science context or a Maharanga Māori context or whether it's a freshwater terrestrial or marine domain we have all of these sort of high level uh, areas of um, human concept and also ecological activity and we try, you know, we're trying to draw it together into a clear outcome and so one of the themes of my evidence is actually, you know, the need to get this integrated approach across the terrestrial domains as strong as we can in, in any RPS. That's a bit of a battle at the moment. You can only do my evidence. <laughs> <laughs>
I don't think I noted for the personal environment in, in your evidence any particular questions that I had either, but I was going to show my ignorance by asking you at page 11, uh, you referred to um, indigenous, and I'm not even sure that I'm pronouncing it correctly, halophytic plant species. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, um, halophytic means it's salty, a dry land um, ecosystem which is um, where salts um, accumulate in the soil structure and um, create a soil profile which is toxic to some plants, but other plants which are um, adapted to that um, can thrive. And Otago is unique in New Zealand that it has inland halophytic ecosystems. Um, and we get plants that you see in the salt marshes at Aramwina and elsewhere in, in some of these places in central Otago. Yeah. Well, I think <laughs> and, uh, I, I, I'm sorry. I do have a question. Thank you, Ray. The map that uh, we were talking about previously, the shorts on page 21 of this, of this, um, Evidence yeah. and habitat areas. And if I go back to the point I was alluding to earlier on about how Kai features very largely in the minds of of Kaitahu, the whole Mataranga Māori thing, I look at that map and I see things like dog cockles. You know, I've got no idea what the hell dog cockles are. Um, scallops. Uh, horse mussels, tube worms, sea cucumbers, and I'm looking for things like kina, awa, and other stuff. You know, and <clears throat> um, there was a question I was going to ask Dr. Schultz before. Maybe uh, between the two of you, you can sort of come back to me with a response. So. This is effectively a biased sample because it's asked fishes. It's not a comprehensive randomized ecological survey of the resources that are in this part of the Otago. So it's inherently going to be what the people they asked, what they value. So I, I take this point. For fishermen. Though. For fishers, yeah, yeah. I understand it, yeah. And there, there is clearly a, an inshore fishery. There is, I think there's a, a commercial catch for Kinna and Power, but I don't know. And you know, maybe they just didn't talk to the right fishers to get that, that data. Yeah, because if you talk to Brendan Flack, he, yeah. he just said so pretty pretty quickly, I would have thought. Yeah. Just a comment on that. So um I remember from that report where I got the figure from it's largely based on on interviewing uh, retired fishermen. Mm -hmm. So their memory would go long back often of things that clogged up their net, nets that they refer to as rubbish, for example. <laughs> and uh, based on these interviews then, um, or there may have been photographs available for some of those um, species, um, they then piece together what those, what those species in those areas like, likely were. So there's a bit of uncertainty around that as well, but I think it's probably uh, a lot of that bigger stuff that, you know, that was in their nets that they actually did not want to have in their nets that, that was reported here. And it, it is only, um, as I remembered, uh, the report is only about uh, biogenic habitats, which is, you know, it's, it's habitats formed by living animals or plants. So it, that definition wouldn't include uh, fish. So that's, that's probably a reason why that, for example, isn't, right. isn't part of this map. Yeah, but my simple mind just goes to it's in the sea, you know, it's mm. in the rocks. And, mm. yeah, it's like where everyone sort of interacts, you know, with with the marine space. And, 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 and but what this does ram home, though, is the fact that one, it partly depends on who you're talking to. You know, if you talk to a particular group, they'll all focus on things like horse muscles and stuff like that. Unless you talk to a Brendan Flack or David Higgins, and they'd say, well, in a, you know, card or whatever. Um, it's just, yeah. <clears throat> I, I may have misread the, the map, but that's what 
one of the messages I took from reading, looking at it. And I think, uh, admittedly, I probably could have made it clearer because uh, also from coming to yesterday's hearing, I realized that my evidence sort of, although not intended, suggested that, you know, there's really hardly anything we know. And there's a lot more that we know than on this map. Yeah. Um, so just to put your that's point up. That's an important point to make. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, and so now I have Dr. Rishasam, who is here to. Sorry, I'm not I have Dr. Rishasam, who is going to come up and answer any questions you might have about her evidence, which is focused on freshwater minerals, but which also traverses into a coastal environment. Thank you. Um, I guess probably the discussion we have just had around those linkages is probably the focus on the, what I've read of your evidence around the coastal environment. And you made a comment at um, 100 and paragraph 119 that those linkages could be made if it was clear in the RPS. I was just trying to work out here whether you are you meaning in terms of the wording of the policy, in terms of recognizing those linkages and how they should be dealt with, or is it a cross referencing issue which has been raised also as a problem with this particular policy statement? So I am not a planner nor a policy maker. Well, I did have down here as Mr. Brass addressed this, so yeah. he doesn't tell him off. <laughs> but I do believe that it is possible to um, insist on those relationships and it might be possible to uh, de-silo these different sections uh, of the RPS by clearly stating those linkages. So I tried to do that exercise, uh, I think, with um, the INACA spawning grounds. Yeah. Um, Exactly. So, yeah, just try to to go through that process for a particular issue uh, that I'm aware that. of, and yeah, been like, well, these policies from the coastal environment chapter and from the uh, land and freshwater chapter and the integrated management chapters are clearly connected through that lens of this particular issue. Um. I don't know whether it would make the document unreadable or unworkable. However, I do think that it is important to really create those clear connections, both yeah. in wording and in structure. I think the, for me, a big issue was the structure starting from, this is a whole package going together and then presenting it in silos. Yeah. To me, sort of defeated the purpose. Yeah, I'm just, I wish I had another question just so I can listen to your accent. Thank <laughs> you. The three key species that you focus on here, which are eels, uh, kind of, kind of, or lamprey, and white bank, <clears throat> are essentially freshwater. I mean, but they have a a sort of a, a, an ocean component to their life. You know, they go out there and they spawn. Of course, they, um, <clears throat> I'm not quite sure what my question you know, is. He's thinking with his stomach. <laughs> well, it is roughly around, it is largely around that. It is around the, the Kai aspect of all this. Um, <clears throat> um, because, I mean, these three are key. Kai species for Kaitahu, absolutely. Uh, there's no mistake about Inaka and, and um, Tuna and Kanakana, kana, uh, uh, sort of at the core of the stuff they talk about. Um, I guess my question is going to be around are we, have we recognized that sufficiently? 
in the regional policy statement, you know, in, 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 in that it's a key kai component for Ngaitahu. And, <clears throat> and are we looking at both the coastal environment component of their life cycle and the freshwater one? Are they, are they, they are linked, but do we, in this part of, of the regional policy statement here in the freshwater, the non-freshwater, trying to sort of, one, on the one hand, <clears throat> recognize that there is a, a difference, and yet at the same time, to go back to the Hackney unit of Kintai, uh, is that they are linked. Is that the way you, uh, you, you, you put your, your evidence together? Or tell me how you, how you... Well, you just described a huge conundrum I had had <laughs> with <laughs> separating the non-freshwater plant instrument from the freshwater for freshwater species. And the way I put together my evidence was, I think, mostly based on these particular life cycles where terrestrial, freshwater, and coastal have kind of equal importance because these species' life cycles depend on what's incoming from the land, what is available in catchments, in lakes and rivers, streams, the types of habitats, the range of habitats they, they require to complete their life cycles, that connectivity to the ocean and then what is happening on the coastal area. Uh, one of the things, for example, I was listening to your exchange with uh, Dr. Schultz regarding these information gaps uh, with mapping of different species. And I was thinking, oh, the nursery areas for the white bait species are coastal. We currently don't know where they are. And yet the regional policy statement should account for uh, that requirement for the species, while at the same time not necessarily having the information at hand. So it is a matter of establishing policies that um, cater to these knowledge gaps. Again, difficult to, <laughs> to implement maybe, um, but yeah. Um, and so to go back to your question, the way I structured my evidence was really by trying to highlight those linkages, those Kiyotakutai linkages. Um, regarding the, the cultural importance of the species, I, I, it's not my place to address this. They are important from the department's perspective intrinsically because they are native species, because they have particular life cycles. I do uh, highlight uh, or insist as well on uh, non diadromous galaxies as well in other parts of my evidence, just because they make things a little more complicated when it comes to issues dealing with connectivity and the, the need to protect uh, the habitats because of different pressures that they're facing. Um, and so, I am very much aware that the RPS is going to be this exercise in balancing uh, divergent risks uh, and, and requirements for different types of species. And uh, again, my second point again is as much an observation as anything else. Or oh, there is a question. I mean, I've often wondered what the real significance or importance of galaxies. Uh, to the sort of the wider environmental thing, uh, given that in in <clears throat> say Gaita, who would argue there aren't too many galactics they could eat, I don't know to my stomach, and <laughs> analogy stuck before. But I've off, it, it, I was on the Nevis hearing, and we found we thought we discovered a new galaxy, and we called it. What, what do we call it? I forget. What we, 
um, Galaxia Flavius. Uh, it is now known as Galaxia Snevis, but um, at the time I think we were calling it the Smeagol because the one that it came had had, and actually it was the other way around, the Galaxia that had diverged from it was the Golem, which is, um, so the Golem is found in the material yeah, Golem, yes. and then the Smeagol, which was the other name that Golem had, right. was what we were calling the Nevis yeah. Galaxia. And even at the time, I, I was I kind of still struggle to, I guess, to really comprehend the the um, almost relevance of the, the importance of galax galaxids. Food for trout. Eh? Food for trout. Well, <laughs> that's how somebody described them at the time. But that didn't go down well. No, they say. are extremely rare. Oh. They are part of the, for me, the intrinsic wealth of Aotearoa. Okay. They only exist in pockets of rivers of this country, and losing them would be an irremediable loss. Um, yeah, they're exceptional little things. They're also very small, aren't they? Well, some of them, they can, but, you know, it's the small, humble creatures that make life more, most interesting. Oh, sorry, advocacy. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, and just one question from me. I'm, I'm just, um, I suppose, curious about where the key pressures are on, on some of these species that are relying on freshwater environments and then, and then the, you know, the, the estuarine lagoon type coastal wetland environments and then out to sea. You know, where, do you have a feel for, um, yeah. And appreciating that this is probably going to be different for different species, but where are the key pressures coming on those species? Is it mostly uh, at sea or at land or in the, the sort of transition area? Uh, all of the above. Yeah. Um, uh, unfortunately, you might say. <laughs> yes. In terms of hierarchy of pressures, this is going to depend on the life stage. Mm -hmm. uh, in rivers, I would argue that habitat loss or habitat degradation uh, would be the, the main issue. In the coastal area, as I mentioned, uh, this is a transition area or a nursery area for some of those uh, diagramma species. So it is going to have to do with uh, sediment load, habitat availability, habitat disturbance, and then climate change looming very heavily with temperature modifications, how sea level rise is going to impact those nursery areas. Um, and then, of course, water quality uh, will matter uh, as well, water quality and quantity. Um, and, and as climate change effects come up, it is my view that there will be new pressures that are more or less expected, but um, the introduction of new species, uh, the spread of pests, uh, the emergence of um, new pathogens, parasites, um, it, it is going to be um, a moving uh, environment, mm -hmm. very much so. Um, so, yes, to me, habitat, well, habitat comes first, habitat structure and then habitat quality. Uh, and yeah. and so there's pressures right across the spectrum. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Oh, well, good luck to them. <laughs> yeah. 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 Nice. Some of them are quite resilient. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, and that's Kanakana kind of, kind of is pretty resilient. Uh, they've been around for million years or so it'd be a shame you know yeah yeah they're pretty cool yeah okay thank you some of some of us are trying to help by catching those trout yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i must say i found your paragraphs on uh, the transmission of 
folks are plasmosis uh, scary. And, uh, <laughs> oh, <that's funny. laughs> it's interesting. Uh, how on earth do you pronounce the word double O? The what? The double O cyst. How do you pronounce it? Uh, I pronounce it O cyst, but, but I'm not sure that's the English pronunciation. And the di diadromous? Diadromous. Diadromous. Yeah. Diadromous. Right. While we're on that subject, other ones that your paragraph 58. The doctor can have to talk. Read out for me. Which is just sticking with the first words. What are the first words? How do you pronounce those? Cool. <laughs> so, the, well, yes, this is an, uh, 101 on migratory yeah. patterns yes. and species. You have amphidromy. Right. Well, I pronounce it amphidromy. <laughs> <laughs> Empidromy, uh, catadromy, and anadromy. Right. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, just while we're on that page, on page 18, um, you you say that adult um, inunga uh, mature and spawn in freshwater while larval growth occurs at sea. And I was just intrigued um, how does that bluff uh, process that they're talking about at the present time, how does that work? For the um, uh, you know for the actual spawning process and larval growth process, do they have a freshwater and a seawater set of tanks at, at the one location? Oh, you mean at the aquaculture facility? Well, there's a commercial yes, activity uh, about the So the maturation process of the year happens in freshwater. Uh, naturally, what triggers the spawning event is going to be some uh, um, water fluctuation levels, as far as we understand it. I would, uh, from what I've heard, not on Inanga, but on giant kokopu breeding, uh, what they actually do is, oh, what's the term? Uh, milting? No. Milking. Mm -hmm. Mil mm -hmm. Yeah, it is milk. <laughs> milking. So they will uh, retrieve the, um, the eggs from the females and the, the sperm from the males and, and do that externally uh, and then uh, allow the eggs to hatch. And the larvae, I actually don't know whether they will uh, change the water composition, the salinity composition for the larvae. In some cases, um, we know of those species that are able to form landlocked populations. So I don't know whether they keep them in freshwater throughout, or whether they change the salinity. Uh, however, the only um, hatching success rate that I'm aware of for giant kokopo was around 3%, which is not much. Um, but I'm not, a, I'm not really uh, privy to the whole process that the industrial process for those species. Just at uh, paragraph um, 101 and um, it was 102 those um, it's not local so the outlets from Lake Shui, Bori and uh, Waihola you say are tidally influenced yeah. and just looking at them on the map looking at them as we fly in and out. Um, uh, are you saying that that whole Tyree River mouth stretch is um, has a saline content to it? Right. Yes. I have children who row and um, they row from Henley, um, which, and that portion of the river is definitely influenced by the tide. It makes right. quite a difference. Right. Right. Otherwise, I've got no questions. Thank you very much. We're probably at uh, morning tea. Yes. I'm going to that. So, happens to us after that. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Ms. Williams. Apologies, Commissioner, yes, um, And Mr. Brass does have a statement that he has prepared, and that is because Mr. Brass is very conscientious and has been firstly considering um, the, the additional evidence that Mr. McKinnon prepared and also listening into the hearing. Good, Dr. Schultz and uh, Richardson are very conscientious as well. So, I'm going just so my speaking notes, just to be clear, are not intended to um, summarise or address my um, original evidence. Um, it's really just about responding to some of the matters that have come up in discussion so far, uh, which hopefully to assist the panel. So I'll just quickly go through that and see the five coastal indigenous biodiversity. Um, Mr. McKinnon's opening statement provided the hearings to these changes um, to shift to some clauses relating to significant natural areas and to power uh, species and ecosystems. Um, the shift down to clause one, which is the avoid adverse effects, to clause two, which is the avoid significant adverse effects and avoid remedy mitigate um, other effects. Um, his reasoning there was that more aligned with the NCPS policy 11. Um, I do agree that the proposed change would, strictly speaking, give effect to Policy 11. Um, however, I know that Policy 11 does not act as a bar to applying high levels of protection um, with those that are specified in that policy. Um, and Ms. Williams' legal uh, submissions also address that point. Um, and as well as considerations under Section 6C of the Act, which have been noted, I also refer the panel to the Regional Council's functions under um, Section 30. 1C IIIA, uh, which relates to the control of the use of land in particular, and 31GA. Um, and both of those relate to biodiversity in general. They're not um, limited to areas of significant biodiversity or significant habitat. Um, they're broader than that. So it's quite possible that an exercise in its function in that regard, um, that the Regional Council um, can appropriately go beyond just dealing with significant um, values. Um, and the panel has heard from the Director General's uh, experts on the values in the Otago Coast. Um, looking at how that proposed change would operate in practice now, um, I understand the structure of Mr. McPen's redrafting is based on coastal SLAs. Um, it seems to fall into three categories, those with um, policy 11 A values, those with 11 B values, and those with other biodiversity values, so that can be values that are captured by Appendix 2 but don't um, directly map to policy 11 A or B. Um, his drafting would apply an avoid adverse effects approach to the 11 A values and an avoid significant adverse effects and avoid remedy mitigate otherwise approach to the 11B and other values. Um, however, in my experience, many if not most coastal SNAs would have a mixture of values, potentially including all three categories. And I hope this was a um, public discussion from Commissioner Sullivan earlier, um, looking at Dr. Schultz's tables and how often things are occurring in multiple places um, across those tables. And certainly in my experience, um, that's what I would expect to have in a lot of cases when you're making an SNA. It's not going to have one neatly defined and contained value. Um, you're often going to have multiple values within them. Um, so, with that, I'm unclear whether Mr. McLennan's intent is that an SNA would be managed uh, for the highest category of value present. Um, so, if you've got an 11A value present, then that avoid effects policy provisions would apply, um, or whether each each specific value within an SNA would have um, a different approach applied to itself in the SNA. You'd have to understand each of the individual values and then map them to the first or second part of that policy um, as appropriate. And I consider there's a risk that either approach would require a significantly more investigation and effort, um, basically to understand exactly what those values are in any particular case. 
and be more complex to implement than the earlier drafting, which was a much simpler effort that triggers that too, um, and then it falls under the avoid adverse effects. Um, also in relation to this proposed policy, the chair has questioned whether identification of specific ecosystems, vegetation types and areas is required under um, the CPS policy 11. And I agree, there is no directive of requirement for identification. The directive requirements for lack of avoiding, remedying and mitigating adverse effects. Um, however, in a practical sense, I consider um, that the need to identify the system of vegetation parts and areas with those values is a direct consequence of the requirement relating to effects. In the absence of information about what values you've got, it would be very difficult for a regional plan or district plan process to assess what plan provisions are required um, to meet NCCPS policy 11 in terms of protecting that indigenous biodiversity. And so, my view is that while it's not a, um, a direct requirement, I think it's an indirect requirement that just flows from the fact that if you're going to meet policy 11, you can't do that in the absence of information. Um, for all the resource consents, it is possible to assess those values on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, however, my experience is that such an approach is inefficient. Identification at the plan level can significantly help consent applicants in developing the proposals. Um, but it's also likely that if significant biodiversity values are not identified in the plan, then the plan rules will need to be more restrictive in order to ensure that the protective requirements of the policy are met, um, which leads to more consents being required and, and in itself being efficient. Um, and just stepping out of the uh, marine or coastal environment. I've been involved in a process where a district plan didn't map significant natural areas. And as a result of that, the council accepted that provisions around terrace and delicious vegetation had to be set. Um, essentially, they were a much um, easier to trigger because if you don't know where those significant values are, You've got to be more precautionary in setting the controls around what activities can occur as a permitted activity. Um, so, in the end, it sort of had a perverse effect um, where the plan provisions become less efficient and more controlling um, than if you're able to target those plan provisions, knowing you know, what areas and what values they really need to focus on. Um, and I may just, uh, with your leave, divert from um, my um, written just to speak for a moment. There's been quite a bit of discussion about how much of a burden on a council it would be to obtain that information. <laughs> and Dr. Schultz has talked about the fact that um, there is quite a bit of information out there, and I just know some other things I'm involved with, um, certainly lots of the university. Um, are doing a lot of work, um, but there is an issue with it not being all pulled neatly into one place. Um, so I don't think we're starting from, from scratch, but I also note from other processes that I've been in um, that this tends to be a progressive approach. So I don't think anybody, um, certainly professionally, I wouldn't expect that. Um, once there's new RPS, the next regional plan or um, coastal plan in a different coastal environment will have a you know fully complete 100 percent everything captured and mapped um, approach to those values uh, that's that's simply not realistic and it's not what happens in the real world um, what tends to happen is that plans will identify as much as they can at the time and that could be a mix of what information is already there and doing some further work um, to put the obvious gaps. Um, but it's, it's normal and accepted that that information will be added to, advanced, built on um, over time. So 
I wouldn't want the panel to feel as an expectation on the regional council that they sort of achieve perfection um, first time round. I don't think I don't think that's expected or realistic. Um, going back now to um, at Paris 7 and CP11 um, Agriculture, Mr. McLean's opening statement right to the hearing suggested changes to remove reference to cultural values um, on the basis of my evidence. And Mr. Barthagat from Pachahu was questioned whether that would affect my intent. Um, I confirmed that I was not seeking to have references to cultural values removed. Rather, I was concerned that only referring to biosecurity risks and cultural values. Mm -hmm. Yeah, an implication that other matters are not to be considered or to be given less in weight. To avoid that, I consider that references to other coastal values, including biodiversity, should be added to that policy. This would ensure that the assessment of what locations are appropriate for agriculture would be made on the round from the start, um, with all relevant values being recognised and given appropriate weight. And I note that Mr. Barthgate has expressed similar concerns. And also proposed wording uh, to bring in those wider environmental effects. For those heads drafted in mind are different. I consider that they are addressing the same issue and seeking a similar outcome. So I would support you know, either version or similar drafting um, to deal with the same effect. Um, and just comments around commercial fishing. The panel's raised questions about the practicality of imposing controls on fishing. Um, I've been involved in other processes where similar questions have arisen, um, specifically in the Northern Regional Plan and Marlborough Environment Plan. So I've had the benefit of giving this issue some thought and discussions with other interested parties. Um, I consider the controls on fishing are a practical, practical option, but as with all plan provisions, they require some thought to ensure that they are both efficient and effective. I consider the controls, for example, which would provide large levels of consents um, for common activities would be unlikely to be enough or unlikely to be efficient and also quite possibly not effective. However, more targeted controls, such as clearly defined, limited and prohibited activities, can be efficient and effective, especially if targeted at specific locations or values. Uh, this is the approach I've seen taken elsewhere. I uh, would you refer to the uh, Northland example to the Environment Court, and that really started with appeals seeking quite a wide range of controls over very large areas. And a large part of the uh, process of the hearing was more tightly defining those, um, reducing the consent categories that were involved, and reducing the areas that were affected. Um, so that was. A live exercise essentially of working out what really is going to be inefficient and effective. And I'm comfortable um, that that, uh, what takes some effort, uh, with that is something that can be done and if required would be appropriate. Um, there will also be requirements on the regional council for compliance, monitoring, and enforcement of such controls. Again, I consider this would require some thought and effort that is entirely achievable. Um, and of course, other regional plan controls also require substantial monitoring and enforcement. Um, and again, I just note in Northland, and I've also, also been involved in Marlborough and discussions around the implementation of the Matiti um, decision. Um, and there are ways and means there is work required um, to make that happen. But in all three of those cases, those councils are uh, at or have reached points where they accept that that is something they can practically do. Um, also, just for the avoidance of doubt, I confirm that I'm not seeking that the um, RPS impose or require controls on fishing. Rather, I consider it's important that it recognises and retains the ability for controls to be implemented if that's the outcome of future regional plan processes. Um, so it's about keeping that option in the toolkit and then through a, a regional plan or coastal plan process you go through the detailed working of what the issues, values, effects are, and what the appropriate policy responses um, and rule responses are. Um, and at paragraph 14, I uh, just know integration and links of other chapters, which has been a um, sort of a constant topic of discussion. 
as a general comment, I know that there are still differences of opinion and approach between different um, Section 32A report authors and a significant risk that coastal provisions will not integrate well with the other chapters of um, the RPS. I consider this remains an area where ongoing work is required. And I would just note um, what I viewed yesterday by Mr. McLean and Mr. Bathgate um, raised the same issue. So I don't I'm saying anything unorthodox. And so I would say those were just some points to respond to things that have come up. Um, but I'm very happy to take questions either on that um, or on my original webinar. Thank you, Mr. Brass. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brass. Um, your summary actually um, ticked off a few questions because they, they did relate to some Andrew's suggested amendments. But just in relation to how policy 11 of the indicated policy statements addressed, um, and I think Mr. Barker had some drafting around the amateur sure who looked at that, potentially addressed that issue. Um, I haven't looked at it in detail, but what have you considered that at all? Um, I've had a look at it, but I haven't looked at it in detail. Yeah, I'm, I'm certainly open in terms of drafting. I guess what, what I hear you saying here and it was highlighted by Dr. Schultz and, and the questions from um, Commissioner Sullivan that there's going to be things in all of those categories. So there's going to be a very confusing mix of tests. Um, when you look at policy 11 in the coastal policy statement, would that not happen under that? If you if you just adopted policy 11, would that not actually happen under that as well? Um, yes, it does. Um, the year on specific thinking, though, is around significant natural areas, and so this is mapped areas yeah. and how they're addressed. Um, and I know there's been some concern from the panel about um, the exercise that's required for the regional council. If it's the, the more recent drafting, uh, where SMAs still need to be dealt with differently depending on the values, would require a higher level of mapping um, for those SNAs. So, typically, um, with an SNA, both in terrestrial and coastal, there can be some, some obvious things that clearly trigger status and there's a bunch of other things around that but you don't necessarily need to um, fully account for all those values i'm just concerned that this approach would require much more detailed accounting um presumably in the plan yeah. for each ECNA of exactly what values are present and therefore which parts of the policy are true on that mapping issue as i'm sure you're aware that the issues that that raises on land and if it's not done and the challenges that can be um, raised in relation to that i guess in one sense in the marine environment at least there's no private land to deal with so it's, well <laughs> mostly, <laughs> mostly. Um, yeah, i'm talking within the uh in the ocean though. even though it's probably a harder task um you don't have those issues with private land on this Having to deal with access to assess values, or is that or is that an issue? <clears throat> so the the only, I think there's still some limited free bond titles in the coastal area which are exempt from the marine and coastal area provisions. Um, I don't believe that access per se is an issue, other than that some of these places are just not particularly easy to get to anyway, just because yeah. of the effort. Mm. Yeah, I am aware in the Mount, for example, um, there are some small offshore islands and rocks, which um, um, I'm not sure um, the chair will be aware of the King Shag, which um, lives in that area. Um, so that can have very high values. Um, some of those rocks are privately owned, I think in all cases by Ewe. Um, so there are some small um, occasions of that, but in terms of mapping at a regional level, I don't think that would be a major um, issue. Yeah. Um, the only other question I had was out of the commercial fishing issue, um, and I think we had a bit of a discussion around that yesterday. 
I'm just interested in your opinion whether you think the RPS actually forecloses the option to address that, or as you're concerned mainly because there there are fishery interests that are promoting a um, greater recognition of commercial fisheries. Yeah, the latter. Uh, I'm comfortable yeah. that the RPS, um, as current drafting, does allow for whatever options prove to be required as we go through subsequent processes. Um, and it's just about ensuring um, yeah, that it's not shut off. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay, thank you. I don't have any questions. Yeah. I do have a couple of questions. Um, just looking at paragraph 66 in your evidence and chief, um, which was in relation to objective C01. And, and just, just your suggestion here around maintained or enhanced versus maintained and enhanced. Is your intention there that it's maintained or where degraded enhanced? Um, I'm just wondering whether you think there needs to be some more guidance as to when, um, when it's maintenance and when it's enhancement. I think there are other places in the provisions where this, this cropped up as well. Yeah, and also the word restored is used in other policies, and that's certainly where one that I would see um, by, the, by its nature applies to uh, where things are degraded. Mm -hmm. um, enhancement, I personally wouldn't want to see that limited only where. Degraded, I guess that because then that depends on what your definition of degraded is and how bad does that be before you want to improve it again. Um, I think there will be a lot of opportunities to improve uh, things, probably particularly in the marine environment, um, without them necessarily being um, about responding to or addressing existing degradation and I mean just as an example I'm familiar with um, Hoyo, the yellow eyed penguin um, they are now recently restricted in terms of their range um, breeding areas and so on um, you could significantly increase their numbers and range and that would be an, enhan an enhancement it's not really responding to specific degradation in specific locations um, and so that's where I would Personally, prefer that, that um, approach to enhancement is kept more general. Yeah, okay. I suppose often when I read maintained and enhanced, I, I struggle with um, uh, how can you do both at the same time if you're maintaining it, you're keeping it the same, and if you're enhancing it, you're improving it. <laughs> I, I suppose. What I'm intending would that there should be a mix of, of both. Yeah. Um, I'm not couple with the idea that you can simply choose to do one or the other. Um, I think at the policy level and at the RPS level, it's useful to have some clear direction that there is an expectation of enhancement, not simply maintaining or repairing, if you like, or restoring, um, but actually trying to improve things. Mm -hmm. I think that's an appropriate high-level policy approach. Okay. No, thank you. Um, I'm just making sense of the questions that I've got uh, written down here.
So um, just looking at policies two and five, and this is in relation to paragraph 75 to 81 of your, of your evidence. Um, I believe. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so, so for, for policy two, and I believe I raised this with Mr. McLean on, on yesterday, um, you were you were requesting that Indigenous vegetation or fauna is included there, um, and then it seems that you were okay uh, with the changes to policy five instead. And the same should come up with policy three, actually. And the policy, and I suppose you were thinking that the changes to policy five covered off um, the request for, to policy two? Yes. Yeah. If you're yeah. following yeah. me. That, that was, it was recognition in the policy that that identification would be required. And I do also note that it is specifically included in method CEM2. Yeah, yeah, and, and I suppose I was I was just looking at those two policies that they actually have um, different intents, uh, and that policy uh, the P two two subsection two is about identifying areas of, of water quality that's that's deteriorated, whereas. Policy five was more about protecting indigenous biodiversity, and given that they've actually got a slightly different focus, um, and I was trying to see how they would have potentially apply differently, and was wondering if policy two would deal more with cumulative effects, for example, and whether there was merit, or, or whether you were selling yourself a little bit short by by accepting that the changes to P five were addressing your concerns with P two. I suppose because with with P2, you know, we're looking at, at, at impacts on water quality that are going to have corresponding significant adverse effects on, you know, for example, ecosystems and natural habitats, whereas P5 is more direct about avoiding or protecting indigenous biodiversity. And and while I and I can see where you, where you've come from with that. Where arguably, if you've got an impact on water quality, that is going to be impacting on, this, you know, biodiversity, indigenous species uh, that should be covered under P five. But I, but I was, was just kind of thinking that there, I mean, there are two policies there for different things. Whether whether P, whether the change to P five is actually going to cover off your concerns to P two. Yeah, it's they are different focuses in those two two policies, and, and P two is really about establishing an information base, whereas P five is about those it's about protecting an indigenous biodiversity. As I discussed, I consider that in order to protect, you need to have that that information. Um, on uh, further consideration, um, I note that the Director General submission suggested adding that to clause two, and I'm just a bit concerned now as to whether that areas of water quality restricts that mm. more than is it appropriate, and that the maybe biodiversity value is unrelated to water quality. Um, and whether if it was something that was kept to be included in CEP2, it would be better as a new clause. This would be five because five must become four. Um, so fully standalone rather than nested under one of the others. That would probably be, if you like, the ultimate. Um, 
um, that I think I'm comfortable with including it in CP5 and seeing it as an integral part of how protection is to be achieved. I suppose it's just with those individual species such as Boyho or, or if we, we bring in um, yeah, some, some of the uh, some of the fish species that are, that are out there and if there's areas of water quality that they're going to that have deteriorated if we're only looking at ecosystems and natural habitats rather than the actual species that may be really dependent on one area but it may not come into consideration under under policy P22. Yes, I think you're correct that limiting it to those um, areas identified um, may not capture um, those more. And so there's a lot of discussion about highly mobile species mm -hmm. um, and see that they are present in the environment um, from Poyo to um, dolphin, fur seals, uh, sea lions. Um, we're there and often. You can have a as part of the life cycle would be, for example, a breeding area that can be needed to find. Um, but feeding, for example, they can cover quite large areas. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, you've just got me thinking now. I'm not wondering whether it's not exactly what was in the original submission or exactly what's in my um, subsequent evidence. Um, but whether an additional clause to see them too about identifying indigenous biodiversity in the coastal bar. That would be the way that would deal with all of those issues. Yeah. So I suppose sort of the justification for the thinking thinking that the matter was covered in P5, you could potentially argue that that 2B wouldn't be needed in P2 as well. So you could probably argue that that's covered by P5. So it was kind of, I, I, I was I was just trying to sort of make sense of where you might have been coming from there. It, it was particularly about seeing their identification as a, a tool in order to achieve protection. Um, and I think that was really my thinking in terms of nesting it within CUP5. Um, but from that discussion, I am now thinking that it would be overall more effective if it was within P2 as a standalone clause. Um, sorry, stop through here. Yep. Um, turning to policy eleven, agriculture. Do you think, um, I was, uh, and I suppose I was looking at policy eight in the NZCPS and whether whether that intends that um, RPSs identify places or for for agriculture, or whether that's the role of a of a, a coastal plan. I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on that because I suppose I was sort of looking at P eleven and thinking it sort of largely reflects what's in, in policy eight again with CPS. Um, do, do you think it reflects enough of a of an Otago kind of context or provides enough guidance for setting uh, for identifying places? Um, as a policy viewed in a standalone way, no, I don't think it, it does. Um, I think effectively it simply brings down what's in policy eight. Mm -hmm. um, it is appropriate that the RPS sets the policy provisions, um, coastal plan will be the actual 
um, dig up work in the background of locations. My concern is that CP11 um, will read on its own, really provides the focus on what the aquaculture needs. There's a bundle of other things that also need to be considered. And as I said, both my and Mr. Barkate's drafting were attempts to make sure that when doing CEP 11, I think really will direct a regional plan to go through a process of identifying, and that will mean mapping, scheduling areas that are appropriate. And that's certainly what we've seen happen elsewhere. Um, I think it's important that that process not be initially driven just by the needs of agriculture, but it includes a wide range of matters that need to be considered. Um, and that is why my preference is that that's explicit within CEP 11, so that it's clear that there's a direction there at the coastal plan stage to identify those areas and to consider all of these things when identifying those areas. If Coastal plan simply identified areas that were suitable for agriculture. In terms of those needs of agriculture itself, you're going to be left in a situation where that's going to conflict with, for example, significant natural areas. Um, there would, I'm sure, there would be areas of overlap. Um, so, if a coastal plan is to do that in a way that is, and I'm thinking also from the industry's point of view, there's you know, creates areas that are going to be useful to industry, uh, then it needs to deal with all of those things up front. And again, referring to the, the Marlborough example, the plan there doesn't identify any areas um, sort of further out. Um, and there's the Blue Endeavour proposal um, by New Zealand King Salmon. And that's got into the situation that because that's going into what do you call it, green fields or blue fields? Let's see. Uh, that the way out. That the plan doesn't provide for it all. It's really just a consent application on its merits. And pretty much anywhere you go in the, the sea, there's going to be values that a proposal like that is going to be potentially conflicting with. Um, so my strong preference is rather than leaving that to a case-by-case -case battle, and as I say, there will always be reasons why not here, um, but it's better both in terms of environmental protection and giving the industry some certainty that the coastal plan deals with all those areas up front, and when it identifies areas that are suitable for agriculture, there's some comfort um, that they are suitable from all considerations and that you're not going to be getting into another battle. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, no, thanks. That's all for me. That's, that's helpful. Thank you. Just picking you up on that last point, uh, I can't imagine an aquaculture proposal going ahead that didn't have a battle bag of it. Uh, it just seems everyone that I was involved with or on either side for 20 or 30 years involved a battle. And uh, that required a side by side detailed benthic uh, assessment of the communities beforehand and the potential effects on those communities. Uh, you just can't get away from it, can you? Um, I think you can, and we are seeing now and it is the, the simpler um, cases so the more yeah. inshore muscle farms um, where there are mapped areas there there's been quite a large number of those going through for consent renewals recently where it's gone through as a controlled activity doc hasn't been involved in those and hasn't had concerns about them yeah, that's because they come from 20 or 30 years of that yeah. in the past um well, yes, but those those battles have now given some clearly mapped locations within the coast that have, and, and through those battles, have been identified as being suitable and appropriate. Um, so certainly what I'm seeing the docs involved in those is that it's not saying um, 
that it wants to continue to challenge those. Been through that process, there was a map area that was identified as suitable for that type of aquaculture. Parties are then really accepting that, and there have been a number of those that have, or because they haven't quite met the um, usually exactly the um, the mapping on the in the district plan, they've been looking to shift the or adjust the the rain farm slightly. Yeah. Um, so that. There's a number of those that have been notified and to my knowledge, DOC has not submitted on any of those. So, so, so I, I, I'm, I'm not. I suppose, Mr. Brown, so I've just got in mind that, you know, the, you look at the Tasman experience, where what you were advocating for, i.e. a plan type approach, uh, led to a horrendous Piece of litigation that lasted. Um, I don't know whether you were involved. I can't. I wasn't the test. No. So, I mean, it, it's, from memory, it took eighteen months, two years, something like that, and the uh, colossal cost of was plans, you know, dental experts, etc. And uh, um, and that was that was a, an allegedly, you know, uh, muddy uh, benthos, which shouldn't have, from the agriculture viewpoint. Caused major difficulties and huge expense, um, and I'm not sure that necessarily uh, um, the outcome of that was was what either either side particularly enjoyed. Uh, and it just seems to me that if you compare that with the site by site uh, detailed investigation that uh, is undertaken under a resource consent process, um, you. You're essentially doing the same thing, but it's it's not imposing a great burden on the council itself, trying to identify for industry where um, development can go. Uh, it, it's to me, I'm just wondering, and I'm interested in your thoughts on whether who should bear the cost. Should it be the industry trying to carry out the activity, or should it be the council um, trying to protect, protect the results? My, my starting point really is that that is a function that sits with council and as a result of um, the Act and the NZCPS. Um, so there is a level of, of cost that does sit with councils, and it's essentially within that bucket of things that that's what councils are there to do. Um, I think the question is about ensuring that that is proportionate, proportionate efficient, effective. In the, and I, I can't comment on Tasman, I wasn't involved in that. Um, in the Marlborough example, I think it has got to a place where it is quite efficient for um, all interests in the majority of cases. And so I would promote that in Otago, it's probably useful to go as far as we can in terms of more things can be addressed at the plan stage. The clearer it is for all parties. Um, and so if you think of the, the blue endeavor, that's become you know, a very major process for them. It was outside what the plan covered, so they're really going into unknown ground. The more that the plan can provide, if you like, advance notice of what the issues are and where the issues are and where they are, um, protecting more efficient those processes. But, and, and no, I'm not, I'm certainly not saying it's going to be a, a panacea um, or easy, but I think it is a part of that, that is required for the um, coastal plan and can and should be made as useful as it can be. Well, on, on that basis, if you look at um, proposed uh, Method, I'll pick up the method again. Um, it's uh, CM2, the Roman, uh, well, sorry, just number three. Um, at the moment, it's requiring that the regional council identify areas and values of indigenous biodiversity within the jurisdiction of the courts of CEP5, map the areas and describe the values in the relevant regional. Plans, district plans. Given the evidence we have from Mr. Clark's and, and the you know 
practical observations you've been making. Don't we really need to amend that wording? And, and I, I'm not a planning expert in terms of wording, obviously, but uh, and insert something along the lines, say, after the C reference to CEP5, and as appropriate to the state of knowledge, map the areas and describe them. Because what you've said to us in your oral comments, and I was noting them down as you were commenting, was that, uh, look, in a practical sense, nobody's going to sit expect 100% uh, achievement of identification or mapping. Uh, it's unrealistic, it can't occur. Uh, in a practical sense, plans will identify as much as they can. This is what you were saying to us. Shouldn't we be saying that specifically in, the, in this method? I would have some concern about simply locking it in on the current level of knowledge. Um, I do expect that part of the reading council's responsibilities at a process plan stage is going to be doing some fill in of gaps, um, some gain of information places where it wasn't previously available. So I don't, I, I would have concerned with simply locking in on the current level of knowledge. And I guess, because I'm a planner, um, in, in my view, that concern is already built into the process and that when going through a coastal plan process and following the first schedule and following section 32A and 32AA, um, all of that drives a process of understanding, ensuring that provisions are effective and efficient. And so from my point of view, that section 32 process drives consideration of what is proportional, what's relevant, what's useful. Uh, I don't think you could justify in a 32, section 32 sense, trying to achieve complete knowledge from day one. Um, I don't think that would pass muster, uh, but I also think that there's the requirement there to be effective, and so it can't just simply be a set on your hands. Um, so it does it does place an obligation on council. But in my view, that section 32, and really it's seen section 32 as a process rather than just a report on a given day. But that does derive that consideration of what is essentially what is material um, and what it's going to add value. I look with some interest at your paragraphs five and six in the summary um, because uh, I'm, I'm probably being a bit cynical, but I was wondering whether that wasn't the uh, frustration of a, a planner with the uh, NZCPS not identifying, not requiring identification in the policy 11. Um, and, uh, um, I thought you worded those quite clearly. <laughs> but, uh, but, what I did want to ask you arising out of that um, was, did you go back to and have a look at the inquiry report? And did it identify a reason as to why identification was required in policies 13 and 15, but not required in policy 11? Um, no, I didn't go back to that report. I did um, go back to the guidelines for implementation um, the NZCPS. So that's the planner saying what the inquiry panel. <laughs> yeah, but as to why the, why the panel chose to draft it with that distinction, um, no, yeah, beyond me, I'd have to say. Right. Okay. Something that we really probably need to look at. That goes in the right. Um, just on. That wording in um, uh, not not in uh, the method, sorry, but in the uh, in policy eleven. If we look at that, if we would uh, not policy eleven, sorry, policy five, C five, I think it was. Yeah, just P five. We haven't decided yet, quite obviously, but if we were to reach a conclusion that identification had too many issues with it, 
uh, and we would have recommended the deletion of the word identifying and uh, the words identifying and so it just started off avoiding from one and two avoiding significant adverse effects etc to what extent um, are we differing from the NZCPS when that's if we did that when that's what policy 11 says in the NZCPS it would strictly comply or reflect the NZCPS I'm not sure that it would give effect and having dropped down a level from an NZCPS um, the expectation is that the RPS will take steps towards protecting postal digits like diversity, um, as set out in 11A and B. Um, my view is that you can't achieve that protection without information to start with. So while it would mirror the expectation at the moment, the point of having an RPS and leading into coastal plans rather than simply leading it all to the NZCPS is to get that level of local flavour and implementation. And so my concern would be that I'm not comfortable that, that would give effect because it's not making it effective. Um, I also have concern from the 30, 60, 32 point of view again as to whether such an approach can be effective because if you haven't got the information um, it's very hard to protect something when you don't know what it is or where it is um, it's also potentially inefficient because you're then leaving it to a consent by consent um, basis mm. and, oh, and what i don't um I, i'm not an advocate or apologist for where rm reform is going and um, certainly the expectation there is to um, drive towards the young officials at the plan stage rather than at the consent by consent stage. Yeah. In, in terms of um, the way in which plans or resource consents deal with uh, agriculture, the difference on my perception at the moment is that. Um, if you look at the Marlborough situation or the Tasman situation, you essentially had uh, an identification of reef areas of value, in particular close to the shoreline. Um, the, in each case, the council basically saying uh, outside of um, those uh, sensitive areas, there was an opportunity for a strip of, uh, of um, aquaculture uh, because that happened to be on a muddy less significant uh, ethos. And, uh, um, but beyond that, you then got into the complex of you know, open space, et cetera, and so uh, prohibited activity out there. Um, down here on Otago, on Mr. Oh, Dr. Schultz's evidence, that sensitive area seems to be living all along the coast and also far wider, potentially, than in those um, other localities. Do you generally agree with that description? I think, from my knowledge, there is a lot more variety of types of coast um, through Otago. Um, the Marlborough Sounds, um, highly valuable as they are, they are a particular type. Um, so you've sort of just got that, that sounds arrangement throughout. Whereas Otago has um, quite a range of coastal environments. And from that point of view, if you're looking at mapping what areas were suitable for agriculture, I would expect it's probably at a, a coarser level. So and, and Marlborough have now you know, got down to you know, very you know, tightly defined within you know, a matter of meters, and that's why it's doing um, you know, some marine farms a bit of grief when they want to go five or ten metres um, to one side or another. I wouldn't um, expect that there's that level of information available to do that sort of an exercise in Otago, so I think it would be a coarser, a coarser level. Right.
Oh, yeah, look, that's just interesting. You were carrying up a little of your summary for today, um, and, and I think it was an oral comment you made really about the uh, <laughs> Northland controls. And as you were speaking, I, I just wrote a note to myself um, what, what sort of controls, what, what actual controls were imposed in terms of commercial fishing to protect uh, SMAs or whatever it might have been up in uh, the Northland area? Um, so at the start of the process, it was looking at um, quite large areas. And through the course of the, and, and essentially there was an, an A, B, and C areas, and there were two separate proposals where they both had their own versions of A, B, and C in terms of the level of protection. Through the course of the process, that aerial extent was significantly reduced and really focused on, if you like, the A and B, the, the areas for highest value. So it was partly a location or, or extent. Um, The actual mm -hmm. so in terms of the controls, that also started with quite a wide range of controls, um, including some that would have triggered requirement for consent. Um, so it was essentially, you could almost describe it as a winnowing exercise. Some things were dropped out because they were unnecessary or conflicted with um, controls under the Fisheries Act. Um, and I, I'm sorry, Penny will provide you with the decision. Mm -hmm. I don't think there was anything left that required a consent. So it became um, essentially an area of within these mapped areas, um, you can't do, these, these things are prohibited. Um, so it became so much more defined. Bottom trawl, was it? Was um, it so it was, um, it was fishing activities and certain species. You don't have it. I'm sorry. I, I, to be honest, I, my focus when I was flicking through the decision was actually on um, the Fisheries Act section, so I wasn't looking quite as hard at the, how they right. actually implement the controls, but it does go into that in quite some detail. Right. So, as I say, I'll, oh, well, I'll provide a copy of the decision and that will assist. Thank you. We'll look at that. Thanks very much. So, that's the case for the coastal environment. That indeed, that is, that is the case um, for the Director General on the coastal environment chapter. And um, I think we are coming back in two weeks' time. I don't remember which particular hearing that is. EIT. Um, uh, EIT. Oh, there we go. We'll see you then. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Your Honour, Mr. McLeod, we, Your Honour, Mr. McLeod, we need you to uh, speak for you to come up on the street. <laughs> okay, um, I am here. Good morning, still six <laughs> minutes to go. Uh, thank you for um, seeing me a little bit earlier today. No, well, you're helping us, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it works both ways then. Um, look, I hope I can be really, really brief today. Shall I just get going? Thanks. Yes, you okay. Yep. Sure. Um, my evidence on the coastal environment topics, only a couple of paragraphs, um, 8.1 through, I think, to 8.6. And um, perhaps if I start at the back end and say that I do highlight my agreement with the Section 42A recommendations in relation to a number of policies. Um, that said, I was reflecting on policy um, CEP9 this morning and just wondered about the expression a little bit. Now, I don't even think that Transpower has scope for this, but I, I note that in 2A, it, it refers to recognising and providing for the functional needs and operational needs of the um, nationally significant infrastructure. And I sort of wonder if it ought to be flipped on its head and you're recognising providing for the infrastructure where it has those needs, so functional and operational need for its location in the coastal environment. It's, it's, it's just something... That, I noted this morning and I thought it was worth highlighting. Um, now, the, the remainder of my evidence on the coastal environment topic really goes to um, a bit of, bit of policy statement architecture, if you like, and how, how various chapters work with each other. And I know you've, you've heard from me and a number of others 
on that matter. And then it's also just about how you reconcile giving effect to the New Zealand Coastal Policy Statement and the National Policy Statement for Electricity Transmission. Um, and to, to some extent, in my evidence, I've suggested that, that there be some direction towards the energy and infrastructure chapter. And it's in, it's in my evidence about that chapter where I address um, coastal environment matters in a little more detail. But um, so we, we can either address that today or address that um, when we get to that hearing, when you have the benefit of legal submissions as well. Um, but perhaps just my, my high level observation is that the, um, the, the, the national grid is nationally significant. And, it, and for me, it's about thinking about how the national grid and the coastal environment interact in a way that perhaps sets the national grid apart from any other activities. Like my view is the regional policy statement should give some direction to, to the national grid as nationally significant infrastructure and the coastal environment um, in a way that, that provides a, a pathway through the provisions. And I'm, I'm not suggesting there ought not be a void in some circumstances. And you'll see that my relief um, in relation to the coastal environment explicitly, the, the relief in my evidence explicitly recognises there will be situations where avoidance is appropriate. Um, but it, it's just about re reconciling the recognise and provide and the importance of the national grid alongside the important provisions in the New Zealand Coastal Policy Statement. Um, I'm happy to go into more detail, but also happy to take questions at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Ainsley. Good to see you again. Um, just in relation to the comment you made around policy CEP9, I, I missed the wording you recommended there. It's something about turning that around. Yeah, yeah. So I think I've only got notes in front of me because I've got you up on my screen, but I think it says something like it talks about recognizing and providing for the functional needs and operational needs of the infrastructure. And I wondered whether it ought to recognise and provide for infrastructure that has operational and functional needs for its location. This is, it, and that would sort of um, reflect policy six of the New Zealand Coastal Policy Statement 61A, as well as um, policy three of the MPSCT, insofar as it relates to the national grid. Okay, that's quite helpful. Um, just in relation to CEP10, I think you've indicated you're quite happy with the changes made there um, in Andrew's report. One of those changes was removing the word and between two and three and substituting or. Now, if that didn't happen, um, how would that impact on TransPower's operations? Because I know we'll probably have evidence from Aurora around that issue um, that while you may have a functional need there, it doesn't necessarily mean you can maintain or improve health integrity, form, function, etc. Which is currently the way it's written in the notified version mm -hmm. that you can do that and have a functional need. So if that word's not changed, does it cause transparent problem in that context? It, it would um, be more problematic, yes. But I, I haven't um, turned my mind in detail to how how problematic that might be. I'm sorry. So, I'd be I'm struggling to think of where Transpower may have um, transmission towers, etc., in the coastal marine area. Yes, there are uh, distribution networks, but not transmission. I would call at least they cross estuaries, so no. Uh, in, in Otago, there's not currently any national grid infrastructure in the coastal marine area. Um, that said, uh, Mr Noble's evidence does indicate that there have been approaches to Transpower for the development of new infrastructure in the coastal marine area where, for instance, it might be connecting to some new generation. Yeah, okay. Yeah, well, thank you. The only other thing was... Um, the only concern sort of remaining in your evidence, I think, was around that linkage, which we've been hearing a lot about. <laughs> yeah. You know, I guess, well, Andrew's promoted the um, 
in that policy reference to the EIT chapter. Mm -hmm. Your evidence is just going that step further and specifically identifying that policy. Is it not achieved by that reference anyway? Or you to, to some extent, the concern would be if there's an avoid, a, a, a firm avoid policy that effectively says that the, the scheme of the regional policy statement treats all activities the same and um, a, a policy that would achieve a king hit, if you like, to being able to um, develop the national grid in certain areas, um, given those technical and operational needs. Um, you know, I think that the architecture of the regional policy statement anticipates some kind of particular direction or particular pathway for um, regionally and nationally significant infrastructure. I mean, there, there are the policy placeholders there already in the energy and infrastructure chapter. And my evidence is saying that perhaps the RPS currently doesn't go far enough in terms of providing that particular direction and ensuring that there's no king hits. It's, it's about finding that pathway and acknowledging the importance of nationally significant infrastructure. Yeah, yeah you're not the first to raise that, and I'm sure you won't be the last. And I'm sure I'll probably say it again too. I'm sorry. In a, in a couple of weeks' time. Yes. Um, that's all I had. Thank you very much for that. I don't know. No, Alice, Alice covered off what I had. So th thank you. Thank you very much. And I just really wanted to uh, make sure that um, I got down that wording. Uh, on P9. I can I can send a quick email to the hearing administrator if you like. Well, I was just wondering, given what you just said, um, the phrase at the end, where appropriate, would preferably be at the start, would it? Where appropriate, recognising and providing for nationally significant infrastructure as the regionally significant infrastructure that has functional need, functional needs and operational needs. Is that what you're saying? No, no, I don't know that we're appropriate to, I don't know that we're appropriate um, needs to be in there at all, to be honest, but um, I can I can send through some proposed wording, but I do note that I don't think that Transpower has particular scope to tinker with that clause in policy P9. Well, Transpower may not have, but the reality is that this is mission by what Corte has led to that, um, the introduction of that provision, so it's mm -hmm. for us. To uh, yes. come up with a wording. So we can listen to you and, if necessary, <laughs> make some adjustments if, if we uh, thought what you said had some force to it. Oh, thank you. Um, shall, I, shall I just send some tracked wording through to the hearings administrator? Would that be more helpful? It probably would. But yeah. even back in two weeks' time, you can bring it back then. Like, okay. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So is uh, Sarah as well? Just coming up. She went out for Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Morena, uh, what was it, Morena? No, it's not that. <laughs> uh, Kia and so, um, nice to see you, and we're we're in your hands. Right? Uh, kia ora. Uh, good afternoon, Commissioners. Um, uh, I think, um, well, I've appeared before you um, with Peter Robertson um, for the integrated management parts of the hearing. Um, so today I'm here to highlight our key points in relation to the Wakakotahi Coastal Matters. Um, the Wakakotahi uh, Transport Network needs to provide for both um, new infrastructure and upgrading maintenance of existing infrastructure. 
and um, particularly with the last, the latest severe weather events and devastation across the country, um, particularly for our rural communities, it's highlighted how significant our roading infrastructure is to connecting communities to services. Um, some of these roads, of course, um, are within our coastal environment. Um, the key points raised in my evidence um, relate to the appropriate recognition and provision for infrastructure in the coastal environment, um, particularly where there's no other option to connect people and places. Um, it's an activity recognised in the NZCPS as important to the social, economic and cultural well-being of people and communities. And um, the NZCPS provides for activities um, that have a functional need like infrastructure to be located in the um, coastal marine area. In relation to our submission, we had primary submissions on um, CE policies four, five, and six um, to recognize the functional and operational needs of nationally and regionally significant infrastructure and for the wording to reflect um, this in the policies. Uh, the reporting officer um, didn't recommend including such wording in these policies, but recommended amending CE. P9, the activities on land within the coastal environment and the inclusion of um, a new provision 2A. Um, and uh, while I'm supportive of this inclusion, I consider that the words uh, where appropriate um, are not necessary, as is qualified by having um, a functional and operational need. Uh, the addition of where appropriate adds uncertainty even though that um, the CE P93 sets out the importance of the provision for infrastructure to the social, economic and cultural well-being of people and communities. Um, I think that the words where appropriate um, only gives higher uncertainty that infrastructure can or should be provided and is potentially not what the NZCPS has envisaged. In my evidence, um, I've not addressed the additional wording to CEP5, um, the Coastal Indigenous, Indigenous Biodiversity, in relation to um, the provisions for 1G and H that specifically protects coastal um, indigenous, indigenous biodiversity um, identified as SNAs under AP2 and um, those identified as um, TALCA. Um, in accordance with Eco M3. The inclusion of these criteria with an absolute avoid, within an absolute avoid context places additional risk on the operational and functional need for infrastructure to be located in the coastal environment. Um, while my colleague um, Leticia Jarrett will address in her evidence um, the concerns with APT2 in identifying SNAs, Coastal environments being largely natural and untouched are highly likely to meet this AP2 criteria. Um, and within the infrastructure chapter, um, the EIT INF P13 for areas that are outside of the coastal environment is, as a first priority, um, look to um, avoid locating infrastructure um, in, in SNA. For linear transport infrastructure, such as state highways, um, in many circumstances, um, these cannot always be avoided. And this leads on to um, my other key submission, um, to give appropriate recognition within the objective level and objective CE05 activities in the coastal environment. Um, the recognition and provision for infrastructure, in my view, is needed at the objective level to enable infrastructure in the coastal environment, and particularly to reconcile potential conflict in the INF chapter. It is my view that the NZCPS provides for infrastructure, and this should be reflected in the objectives and will provide a clear linkage between objectives and policies. Um, I am happy to take any questions. <laughs> thank you, Ms. Hope. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Hope. And um, I'm not sure if you heard our um, discussion with uh, Mr. Cloud from Transpower um, on the same provisions, actually, in uh, 7.2, where you talk about CP9 and the 
the removal of where appropriate. I, I guess you're seeing that as a, a test almost that could create some uncertainty for it. Well, how is that test going to be applied, I guess? Um, and I think uh, Ms. McLeod recommended, she did say she didn't have a submission on this, but what Katohi does, um, a redrafting of that particular amendment proposed, um, recognising and providing for infrastructure that has the functional need and operational needs um, to locate there. Without that, we're appropriately. What do you think of that draft? I would be supportive of that. Yeah. yeah the other thing in, in your proposal, you, you, you retain the reference to nationally and regionally significant in that CP9, but in your recommended change to the objective, you've just referred to infrastructure generally. Um, but I didn't go back and look at your submission in relation to P9, whether it was infrastructure in general or is it qualified by being national and regional? Because a lot of infrastructure locates in the in the coastal environment, which has quite a significant landward component. Um, and that, that uh, amendment proposed really only picks up um, national or regional infrastructure. So did you have a comment around that at all, whether they should be aligned? Yes, they should be aligned. But um, I think the scope of our submission um, uh, in the objective was a further submission to Aurora. So um, therefore, I did not um, recommend uh, it just applying to national and regionally significant infrastructure. But um, in terms of CE P9, I do think that it could apply to all infrastructure. Yeah, and that's within scope of your um, submission. Yeah. But just while you referred to the Aurora submission, um, and I'm not sure how far your further submission went, but you've referred to CEP 10, which is specific to the coastal marine. Um, and we just had this conversation with Mr. Cloud as well. The, what is recommended there is that the word and between uh, clause two and three be removed and changed to or um, on the basis of that, it may have a functional need to be there, but it's not necessarily going to be able to maintain the integrity, et cetera, form and function of the CMA. And uh, reading your evidence and Mr. Robinson's around what consent you had in the CMA, I would have thought, that would be an issue for you if that um, that wording wasn't changed. Did you, did you guys have a submission on that or have thought about that at all? Uh, let me just have a look. <laughs> you may have supported it, dear Aurora. We, our submission supported um, CE P10 and to retain as notified. Um, Oh, okay. So, all, all yeah. Here. But, so if we took the example of what you referred to in your section five um, and the, the roading just north of Dunedin along the coastline and you have works in the coastal marine area and if we took CEP 10 as notified with the and between two and three, how do you think that those works would fit within the scope of that policy? So I didn't actually, I'm not sure I fully understand um, the changes that you are uh, um, oh. requesting to change. So in the, um, the, uh, the version that I have, it's deleted and, and then, and then it just goes, 
on to three have a functional need. So you are requesting or suggesting that it um, include the words or between two and three? Sorry about that. I'm, I'm looking at um, uh, the most recent version that Andrew recommended in the supplementary evidence in the word or was uh, added in there. But I think it probably has the same, same effect. Um, uh, between three and four? No, uh, between two and three. Oh, maybe. Sorry, I am. Um, I am looking at yeah. a obviously not the correct version, which I thought that I was looking at. No apologies for that. <laughs> yeah. So, as notified, that two was maintained and improved, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, in the coastal marine, and you had to have a functional need to be there. Um, on the basis of Aurora submission, that end was taken out and an ore put in there. So you didn't have to do both. You either have a functional need to be there or uh, you're maintaining the integrity form, et cetera, of the coastal marine. Um, that sounds sensible to me. Yes. Yeah, I thought it might sound sensible. <laughs> <laughs> you got me in the end, but yeah, it was basically Aurora saying, well, we need a we have functional and operational need to be there, but we can't necessarily maintain or improve the health and theory form and function of the coastal marine. So that's where that change has come from. And when I read, <coughs> since you have in that area, I would have thought that would apply to you guys as well, because you're going to do quite a few um, unnatural things, should I say, should I say <laughs> to the coastal marine area that may not fit within that. That's correct. We can't always improve um, improve it. I mean, we're lucky to even um, maintain the baseline of what it was. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. That's, that's all I had. Thanks very much for that. No, Alan's, Alan's come off. Uh, so I just had one query that related to um, your challenge to that wording of where appropriate in the new proposed clause 2A to uh, P9. And uh, you said that it added an uncertainty, but the, the problem is that if you look at the New Zealand Coastal Policy Statement, I'm not sure if you've got that in front of you at the moment. Uh, yes, I can bring that up. If you look at policy 6.2.C, it provides that additionally in relation to the coastal marine area, recognise that there are activities that have a functional need to be located in the coastal marine area and provide for those activities in appropriate places. Mm. So unless that recognition of a a requirement to assess appropriateness was put in place, uh, we would be failing, wouldn't we, to comply with the NZCPS at policy 62C. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I, yes, I do. Okay. However, I think in the context of the RPS, because there are other policies at play, it adds an element of uncertainty that um, there are other things that could be taken into consideration. I think, um, you know, I think, where it says in appropriate places, I think you are thinking about um, an SNA for an example. I mean, whether you would consider that that would be an appropriate place or not. I Well, to some degree, I agree with that. And in other parts, I actually don't, um, but I do, agree that 
yes, that is what is written in the NZCPS <laughs> in appropriate places. Um, but what it has done in this policy context is um, because of the Indigenous biodiversity policy, which um, avoids, um, for example, significant natural areas where we know that it's highly likely that um, infrastructure is probably going to affect, it's unable to meet that um, that criteria and it will be challenged as to whether that is actually appropriate or not. And I think that's where I mean that it's it adds um, greater uncertainty that um, that it's it's something else that um, means that it, that makes it more difficult for infrastructure to be provided because already I would say that it is quite constrained within the coastal environment already through the NZCPS um, and there are if there are other um, provisions which um, conflict with it that um, that just requires um, I guess um, further limitations on on what can actually be done in these areas um, and the flow and effect is, is additional cost, additional time um, and potentially projects actually not occurring and, um, and that's not um, I don't think the intention of the NZCPS. That's obviously an issue that we've got to grapple with. So thank you very much. Just, just on that before we go, I'll just yep. pick up on that, that policy six. Um, I don't want to be correcting the chair. <laughs> but um, go ahead. <laughs> in the context of um, CEP9, which actually relates to land in the coastal mm -hmm. environment. I would have thought policy 6.1e would be the relevant one there, which is the one um, that you referred to what we're discussing in relation to the coastal marine. And it's it's split, and it's split in the RPS and it's split in the policy statement. Did, have you got any comment around that? Because I yeah, the coastal policy statement even seems to think it does just reply, re apply to the marine, coastal marine area, but it does go wider. Yeah, that's right. Sorry. Um, yeah, that that is correct. <laughs> I should have mentioned that. Um, yeah, there's a distinction within policy six um, in relation to the general coastal environment and that within the CMA. So for the general coastal environment, of course, it just um, it considers infrastructure in the context of its importance to social and economic and cultural. Um, well-being of people and communities and um, within the CMA you know it provides for its functional and oper functional needs um, and um, um, you know in appropriate places so um, yes I <laughs> stand corrected. <laughs> yeah it picks it up quite well because it, it splits those two and it refers to land so it's taken that um, policy six one and applied that to land in the coastal environment and then has a specific section on the CMA. Um, and I'm assuming that's because of that split, Andrew, how that's done. Yeah, that's right. So I don't think there'll be any restriction on removing that inappropriate, the appropriate um, limb that has been discussed um, in terms of the NZCPS, because as you say, I'd say it's probably more directed um, policy six, 1A is about the recognition of oh, yeah. uh, infrastructure in the coastal environment more generally. And then 2C uh, has that appropriate places test and that's in the CMA. Yeah. The irony of what we've got though at the moment on, on the draft uh, text rule um, in yesterday was that, uh, and I think I can take the point um, uh, has been picked up by uh, by Alan that uh, in relation to the coastal environment, well, we've got an ironical situation where where appropriate was suggested yes. in nine in relation to the coastal environment, 
but out but mm -hmm. not included in the tent. Mm -hmm. um, and so that I suppose raises the issue do we need to insert it in tent um, to meet uh, policy 62C, but take it out of nine. Yeah, a good question. Um, depending on scope and other things, that that might be um, an appropriate swap. Mm. Yeah, you're right. It is it is a that deals mm. with the infrastructure. Mm. Thanks, thanks a lot for drawing attention to that. Because well, I didn't draw attention to it as accurately as I should have. But <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but so it, many words. But it leads to the discussion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but anyway, Mr. McKenna can think about that. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Yeah. Logan can yeah. come back to us and may reply. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Hope. Thank you. Okay. Well, that, uh, that concludes us for this uh, for this morning. Yeah. Thank you. And we're really waiting for Wise response from Thanks. No, right. Okay. So approximately two thirty. So we've got a two hour. I can I can go and do things.
instances as when you're when you do the commits. Got some copies here. Thank you, Mr. Davis. When you're ready. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess um, I can start reading this, but a, a lot of it is stuff that Hamish was going to address himself. Right. So um, I can cover two or three of the points anyway. And hopefully, you'll join us. Um, yeah, so um, thank you very much again for this opportunity. Um, I'd just like to say that uh, Dr. Stephen Knight Lenian, who you met last time, um, uh, couldn't be here today because of the time, but he's contributed to putting this together as well. So, um, under the scope of this, um, well, just before I start, I should also look, say that. Uh, the oral submission we handed out last time had some typos in it, and when the ORC requested for a, a copy of it, I corrected those typos and put a wee note on each of those graphs that I mentioned to you on the day. So if you're reviewing that, it would be better to use that version than the hard copy I gave you. I'm sorry about that. It's one of those um, things. So uh, scope of the oral submission. Um, the points we wish to highlight in this oral submission link to two key questions. One is what is the best approach and what best settings in the coastal environment um, than an anticipating a low carbon economy? Um, the second is how does the RPS best integrate these with other planning instruments and provisions including Tangata Whenua opportunity. The key points we wish to highlight are, and there are A, B, C, et cetera. A, the precautionary principle must be reflected throughout the RPS proportionate to the risk we face. Given our state of environmental overshoot globally, which we outlined last time, and the um, recognition that we must transition to a low carbon economy without delay, we submit that the forward to the RPS must reflect both the level of risk we face and the magnitude of the challenge. To support this assertion, we pointed out that by its own methodology, the RPS, uh, the proposed RPS, uh, via Table 8 specifically, uh, with regard to climate change alone, places us at very high risk, given that on current predict predictions, we are headed for dangerous temperatures and potentially irreversible effects. To help address this, we proposed an alternative long-term vision in IM01. It reads, by 2035, Otago's communities are thriving within the strongest solar-driven economy in New Zealand, leading the national emissions reduction target while in bed within well-functioning ecosystems and sustainable de deployment and reuse of natural resources for us and our children after us. It seems to us if a community are to set aspirational goals now required, then the RPS is the place to do it. Um, I will jump from this next section through to uh, E on page three.
all development in the coastal environment must be consistent with achieving national emission reduction goals and moving to renewable energy. Because of the close relationship between greenhouse gas emissions and the use of fossil fuels, achieving the national emissions goals will not only we will not only play our part in in moderating climate change, but also go a long way to reducing our vulnerability to energy and economic shocks. So in other words, if we can achieve the climate change reductions we propose in the national goals at the moment, we'll also address economic and other overshoot problems. Therefore, meeting national emissions targets can be used throughout the RPS to satisfy the precautionary principle. To ensure this pathway is adhered to will require links to a set of milestones and trigger points. For example, the graph below shows the sort of progress on greenhouse gas emissions reduction that the, Dan the Danes are achieving, which this RPS must drive for a cargo. And there's a graph there that um, shows in the areas of energy, transport, agriculture, and other sectors that they have quite a nice downward trend going on. We would like that to be happening in New Zealand and this RPS to drive it in Otago, as an example. As a minimum, we request that a specific objective could be added to uh, CE05. Now, this is one of Hamish's suggestions from a planner. Activities in the coastal environment are allowed only within the context of achieving an overall reduction consistent with the nation, with the region's contribution to achieving national targets and the emissions from the coastal envir environment of greenhouse gases that contribute to climate change. With all discharges, this is F, with all discharges, control of potential contaminants must be as inputs rather than outputs wherever possible. If we are serious about controlling levels of contaminants and discharges of all types, then the outcome can be much more certain if, wherever possible, we can control inputs. And that applies really across the board to all potential contaminants. This requires policies that identify inputs and proceed and proceeds to require these to be limited in accordance with wider national targets for achieve for the receiving environment. Um, the other pieces, uh, as I say, mainly contributed by, by uh, Hamish and Stephen, so um, hoping he'll turn up, but maybe we could talk about those, um, anything you want to know about those that I've read. Well, if we can uh, pre-read those. Oh, yes. Oh, well, that's coming, so we're going to take a moment to read those. Right. Oh, yeah, that's fine.
Wondering why we're waiting, Ron. With mm -hmm. a, like you do to clarify the colours in the grey. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They don't. We got them in black and white, and I can't work out what set yeah. or what. Yeah. It's actually back to front, but energy industries is at the bottom. For, oh, okay. So yeah. it moves upwards. Yeah. Which is, that, um, moves down. Yeah. It moves up. Yeah. yeah. Um, because they're in the northern hemisphere, I suppose they do it backwards. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so it looks as if um, the energy industries are getting the main gains there, aren't they? And yeah, and the others are agriculture and chemical aren't changing much. So the other sectors is quite large too. That's a good chop, though. Well, what would be in the other sectors? Uh, well, I think it's probably just everything else. 
um, I suppose, health and um, just how we go about business. What's that? Just how we go about things. Yeah, I think so. So yeah. like um, building efficiencies and stuff like that, and energy use within those things, or is that energy industries? Yeah, I, it's hard, like it's obviously grey areas because you can't function at all without the energy industry. But probably that's specifically the generators and the ones involved in producing the energy. Yeah, and, and, and that yeah. other sectors maybe how it's used yeah. with them, say a building like this or something. Yeah, um, I have to say, I just I just thought it was really nice to see that at least one country in the world. Mm. It seems to be doing something that's roughly right. And we feel as a group that, um, you know, there's a danger that because the goal is so far ahead, that we think we've got a lot of time to, you know, maybe we can continue for a while and then we sort of, we would like to see us into it now and setting that sort of downward trend. Um, across the board, and of course, the ETS needs need to do that. But um, I haven't seen a graph like this for New Zealand. Though. I'm just going to go probably use one somewhere. Yeah, so the broken lines there climate targets out to 2050. Yeah. Yeah, policy targets. Yeah. And we've got um, zero, look like they're going to zero too from this. Seems a bit of a high bar to me, but um, if we get down to 25% or something, that would be you know, roughly where we've got to go anyway, just to get the emissions down. Aim for the stars, land on the moon. Yeah, yeah. Just on the surf breaks, um, just by way of um, anecdote, really, um, we live at Meraki and there's a beach just south of Meraki, um, Kataki Strait, you know, where you come down near the, near the coast there, you can see the sea. And the other day we were there and there were a whole load of those guys with um, surfboards with um, kites oh, zooming yeah. along. There were about four actually. And I got talking to one of them and um, he said they'd come down from Wanaka and that, that beach and one at a tiry mouth are considered to be the best two kite surfing beaches in the south island and it's only a, a marginal surfing beach for the Cardigy Strait there it's not exceptional you know so if you're considering what are important surfing beaches a bit depends on what technology you're talking about you know what I mean <clears throat> um, we could you know, so we need to protect everything as much as we can um, to keep all those sorts of options open. What I thought, anyway. Um, but now we think we've got something significant in our area, anyway. The best kite searching <laughs> beach. Uh, Actually, okay. I, I live at a beach in Wellington, very much like that. It's better known for its windsurfing than it is for actual surfing, although there's a lot of surfing there, but yeah, the awesome. surfing is not unlike surfing anywhere else, but the windsurfing, yeah. it's quite unique. Well, that's because you live in London. <laughs> so <they didn't laughs> know wind was I'm of just trying to sort of justify that. Yeah, you know. well, this fellow said he, he, they could get 40 odd rides in on waves, because they're still coming on the waves, but with the assistance of the kite. Mm -hmm. um, whereas they might sit out there just with an ordinary surfboard and get four rides, you know. You don't actually need I waves though for the uh, kind of surfing. You can just go backwards and forwards without waves as well. Oh, it's yeah. the wind. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 yeah, yeah. But they, they do like the waves. Go on, Mr. Annie. Can you hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you. I hope you can hear me. Yes, indeed. Uh, now, we've heard from Mr. McTavish, and he's uh, presented us with some materials that uh, he then proceeded to read some parts from, but I think Lef, can you um start off C B E and G, I think it was. Uh, yeah, I you'd read E. So C D and G. Uh, no, also B. So I've got 
C, so D, B, B, B through to, um, and I just did B, I did E. Yeah. And F, I did E and F. A, E and F. Hence the discussion of surfing, though, no, listen to just said. <laughs> now, look, we've, we've had the opportunity whilst we were waiting for you of reading those ourselves. Um, so I intended, if we could, to uh, just uh, enable you to highlight any particular points you wanted to highlight uh, orally and then ask members of the panel to ask any questions that they may have. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I'm, I'm glad you've had a chance to read them. Uh, I guess the first point I would make is that I think the um, the proposed RPS has done a really good job of covering many many different points. So I think there has been a, some really good work done by the um, by the council on it. Um, I guess my uh, there are one or two points in our submission that are really just trying to get some things clarified in the parts of mine, um, and just get a little bit clearer direction. But I think we've set those out reasonably clearly in in those parts that you've read. So I think I'll be quite open to any questions that you might want to raise. It's probably the easiest way to go forward. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Rainey. Uh, in which case, we'll start with uh, Commissioner Cuba. Hello, Cuba. Thank you. Afternoon, um, Professor Rainey. Um, Just you, call me Hamish. <laughs> you'll possibly be pleased to know, um, and you may not have seen it, um, the Section 42 a report of uh, Mr. McMenon um, and his supplementary evidence um, actually uh, readdressed some of the, particularly some of the concerns raised by Kaitahu in the submissions and how um, uh, their interaction with the coast is addressed and, and it probably picks up on a number of points that you've raised and you had questions around. So I probably um, suggest maybe you have a look at that because it a new objective is being recommended for um, picking up in, in Mauru. Um, there's also been a change probably to that, um, what you have set out in paragraph 14, CEO 1, just with that and protected being put in a different position, which would probably um, deal with the issue you raised there. And also in paragraph 16, when you are talking about the use of section 33 transfers, which I agree there has been, been pretty limited in this country, but a new method is being promoted for us to consider that actually highlights that um, and provides some more direction on that. Um, so I just make those comments to say that those things you'll pick up have actually also been picked up and were questions we had. Um, just going back then to your paragraph nine, when you talk about um, the control of fishing, and that has been um, a topic of debate over the last day or two, especially with those cases that have come out. Where the discussion has kind of ended up, and I'd be interested in your view on this, is that the RPS in its current form doesn't actually preclude um, the council in the, in the coastal plan using tools that may restrict or address the effects of fishing activity for biodiversity reasons and the like. But that would more likely happen in a coast plan. Um, so I was wondering if, what's your view on that? Do you read it like that or do you think there needs to be some explicit reference to the ability to do that? I, I do read it that uh, it can be addressed uh, in the existing document. I think my concern is that uh, that has been the case ever since the Resource Management Act was first drafted, but there was this uh, misunderstanding that fisheries was outside um, the ability to be controlled. So I just think it'd be worth at some spot somewhere in the document clarifying that those effects do, uh, that fishing activities, the effects of fishing activities on matters covered by the Resource Management Act can be addressed and should be addressed through the um, through the regional coastal plans and uh, when they're developing them. At the moment, we have specific statements on aquaculture, for instance. Uh, I, it almost seems as, if, and we talk about traditional fishing and uh, customary fishing, but it, almost by the fact that we don't mention fishing generally, 
uh, it almost seems like that's not able to be considered. So I just think a, a sentence somewhere just clarifying that that is able to be considered would be all that would be necessary. Yeah, okay. We, we do have submissions, I think, uh, asking for the um, benefits of that to be recognised. Um, but you, you're highlighting the fact we also need the, the um, corollary of that, the, the effects of it to be recognised. Yeah. I guess in relation to that, while I'm talking about social and economic benefit, um, we, we have had a lot of concern raised with various parties about the lack of recognition of some of the social and economic activity in the, in the region that contributes to our wellbeing. Food and fibre production is, is an example. Um, I was just wondering, we, you, you came in on the end of the, the surfing debate, <laughs> and you, your submission is promoting that that sort of be elevated up to the, um, where the national significance uh, level is. I was just wondering the rationale behind that. It is, I know a lot of people like going surfing, but it's a recreational thing. Is that an actual resource management issue in the region? I think the key thing we found and why why it ended up in the in the New Zealand coastal policy statement in the first place is there is actually no other mechanism than through regional coastal plans to actually and through terrestrial plans that connect with the regional coastal plans to actually provide any form of protection for um, surf breaks or any sort of recognition for them. Um, they don't fit the criteria for just about any other mechanism that's available in the marine environment. So that's how they end up in the New Zealand Coastal Policy Statement. And at the Board of Inquiry um, on the New Zealand Coastal Policy Statement, and I was there at the time, they said, we can deal with it, making this point about the national policy statements, but it's really the regional councils that need to identify and um, provide protection for the regionally significant surf breaks. So I think that's why it really needs to be there and highlighted in there. There, there simply are no other mechanisms. Yeah, okay, understand that. I guess also, though, if we go back to the, the coastal processes and, and, and all those sorts of intrinsic values of coastal waters, they would be a natural function of that. So if you don't mess with the coast, you'd probably impact on that anyway. Probably, yes. Um, but we do allow people to mess with the coast that does impact on some of those intrinsic values. So I think there's some advantage in actually identifying... Um, the regionally significant um, breaks so that they can actually have a little bit of um, extra protection provided for them. Yeah. Okay, understand that. Thank you. Um, the only other thing I had, um, is your written submission has clarified a lot of the points, but was in relation to policy five, um, which relates to the Indigenous biodiversity and you just added in recommending that we add in and so clause one identifying and avoiding adverse effects, including a range of things. Um, so I'm just trying to find the paragraph in our submission. Yeah, uh, uh, page 27. So CEP5. Ah, I didn't bring that with me. Sorry. <laughs> okay. It's just a generic question, really. But it's you're actually identifying what some of those adverse effects are. And the question is really, do, do we need that in an RPS? At, at the risk of sort of prioritising them over other sort of effects? I'd really have to go back and have another look at that to be able to answer that fully. I, I didn't, didn't anticipate a question on that, so I'm sorry, I have to yeah. really have another close look. Uh, that's okay. Yeah, well, I didn't have anything further, so thank you for that. Kia ora, Hamish. Um, I just want to make an observation first and then raise a couple of other points from that. The observation I make is, is the follow on from what Commissioner Cubitt referred to earlier on about the Section 42A report that we got yesterday. The update, I guess, on the the latest interaction between Kaitahu and Section 42A reporter, which has narrowed what was originally a, a, a sizable sort of a gap you know, where we didn't quite either understand or, or agree with each other, but we're now down to very, very small, thing, which is 
kind of summed up in your general comment in your table, <clears throat> where you, 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 you talk about the splitting off the coastal system as an historic accident yeah. of the RMA, which, which it is, we well, all agree, but um, I guess the point I'm, I'm um, focusing on is how Kaitahu interests and concerns have been sort of honed down uh, to some extent, arguably in a more understandable form to a lot of people. I think what, what might have scared people in the past is they didn't really understand or they never really stopped to think about it or look at it. <clears throat> and, uh, and which I read from your, your um, uh, submission and your, your comments here, you've spent quite a bit of time looking at it, you've considered it, and, and even down to uh, paragraph 11 in your submission today, and you refer to something that I hadn't really picked up before, but I think it, it's quite a neat thing, which is oceans to the shore. We talk about Kyuta Kitai, but oceans to the shore is that thing about joining up the coastal environment with the land in a way that we've not been able to do, I think, you know, in, a, in our, our normal way of looking at these sort of things, but the oceans to the to the shore perspective, I just think is quite a neat, neat way to look at it. You want to comment any, a bit more on, on what I've just said? I, I think you, you've summarized it really well. I think there's often, um, Kiuti Kitai um, often seems to end at the shore. Yeah. And that, that to me has always been a problem I've had with the, with the concept being adopted. Um, you know, I think it's a good concept for terrestrial and the freshwater, but we do need to have a look at that view, looking at the shore from the seas and the oceans and the fact that that's the, everything ends up there, or most things end up there eventually. So I think you summarise it very well. Yeah, but, but even Kyoto Kitai can be constrained when you come to trying to define what the, the coastal environment is. Yes. Yeah. We've, got quite a bit, we've had quite a bit of discussion over the last couple of days about that. Where does it stop? How do you define it? Does it include how you know how far into land does it go and all that sort of stuff? Whereas a, an approach like this, like Kyuta Kitai, oceans to the shore, Kapitai Moana, again, is a phrase that we don't hear a lot of, but it just seems to me that knitting that sort of stuff together in a in this in a conceptual way, as you have, is, is um, quite nifty, if <laughs> I can put it away. I'm just um, wondering if oceans to the shore, um, uh, where the sea level rise would be, fall into that category, because it's yeah, an impact. I, I, oceans to the shifting shore, to the dynamic shore. The yeah. raising shore, the rising. Yeah. So, I mean, all I've done is I, I went through the table and I picked up where, and you have done it quite a bit. It's not just one, one part of the table. There's about four or five bits in the table. You talk about the Mano and the, and the other, the land-based equivalent of the Mano uh, the Taiao uh, report, um, which again is, is symptomatic, I guess, of, of at least the Kaitahu's focus on Kyuta, Kitai, their concerns around Kaimana or Mahinga Kai, all that sort of stuff that, uh, that's been usefully addressed here. So, I mean, that's what I had. I didn't really have any questions, but I felt the need to just comment on it. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, just, just one question uh, from me. Other, others have been uh, covered, but in, in paragraph 12, we talk about the tools of fresh water must be administered to harmonise with the coastal environment. I'm just wondering what tools you're referring to there. Sorry, could you repeat that? Um, paragraph 12 of, of what we've received today talks okay. about tools of fresh water. And I'm wondering, I'm wondering what you're referring to there. Are you talking more around sort of, you know, planning tools? Yeah, talking primarily around the planning tools. Um, Freshwater management plans, those sort of um, approaches, um, they tend to be oriented towards <laughs> towards logically freshwater and towards looking after the freshwater bodies um, rather than looking after the 
where the things that go into those freshwater bodies end up. So you can end up with cumulative effects from, uh, I think the old saying is, uh, you can deal with pollution through dilution. Well, that works fine in maybe fresh water, but then the pollutants end up accumulating somewhere in the marine environment. Now, some of those might be diluted further, but they could also be captured and especially at estuaries and lagoonal areas um, become quite concentrated. So those freshwater management tools really need to think more about their, you know, the going beyond the ends. What 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 actually happens to their stuff when they go beyond? And that that's the that's the sort of the the concern coming in there. That's why we in in F we're pushing for more more effort to control inputs rather than control the effects of the outputs, isn't it? it fits with that that idea. Yeah, and I think Katie did it. Well, look, I didn't have any uh, further questions. Thank you, Professor Rini, or, or Uber, but uh, just before we close, um, at the end of your submission, there was suddenly, with no sort of explanation, a uh, suggestion that in a regional policy statement we needed to uh, required that there was control of domestic dogs and wild cats and wildlife habitats, etc. Is <laughs> that Gareth Morgan by any chance? Or is that what? Gareth Morgan by any chance? Uh, <laughs> no, um, no, it's um, again the Cardigan Beach um, south of us and the uh, um, Penguin Rescue out at the Lighthouse. Oh, right. uh, um, we, we have people, um, and we live just north of Meraki, so the, we look onto the Meraki Beach to the north, and there are lots of dogs and People walking up and down and cars, and you know, it's it's not an environment where the penguins can nest safely. Right. Whereas they try and nest in the Cardigan Beach, and they try and nest out of the uh, lighthouse. And we've got people doing um, circuits and trapping and do 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 do. And the main woman doing that said to me, "Look, if only we could get somehow get protection." You know, maybe zone that beach for, um, you know, habitat and and the one where we are, you know, for recreation and people to walk off. You know, more separation um, would be really helpful. So I, you're right; it was a bit of a left field, a wee bit like the surf breaks. <laughs> Um, but, fine. Look, you've, you've given the explanation because I yeah, think there wasn't yeah. an explanation for it. So yeah. thanks for that. Yeah. And yeah. thank you both, uh, gentlemen, for coming along and uh, and making an effort to meet our uh, flight time requirements. Very grateful to you both. And we'll conclude the hearing at this stage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.